You still have the hat on. <laughs> oh, that's good, dude. Cheers, dude. Cheers. You didn't hit the bar. I'm sorry. Party fell. Oh, my bad. Well, hello, anyone who's ever got so drunk and tried to turn the subtitles on a movie and then realized that the movie was just talking about how people are moving and thought it was the worst movie they've ever seen. It's called Audio Description, and it's an option on HBO. My name's Jamie. And I... <laughs> Look at the captions. Sam Peter. Welcome to yet another beautiful episode of Drunk and Demonic. On this episode will be our Halloween episode because it's going to come out closer to Halloween. So, in, in fun fashion, like most normal people do, is we decided to watch all. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were gonna keep going. Oh no, I just was thought you were gonna like wait, stop for suspense. No, if it's in the back, it will get flagged for copyright. So you just keep talking. Yeah. So, well, it's really distracting to do it. Okay, especially when I'm playing the notes yeah. on the big piano that's here. Yeah, we so we watched all thirteen Halloween movies this month, and we're gonna get drunk and talk about them. Yeah, um, I'm gonna. Like, we'll get into this a little bit more later. Yeah. But I have only seen before this uh, conquest of the Halloween movies, two of them, uh, ever. So this was really cool for me to go back through, because I have seen the first one before, and then I have also seen Rob Zombie's Halloween before. And that's all that I've seen from this whole franchise, 13 movies. And it was really, really cool to go back through, watch all of it, and see this crazy franchise pan out. That's crazy to me that you've only seen two of them. See, this is my favorite slasher movie. I get it. So, so it probably is now my fl favorite slasher franchise. There's your favorite one. That's, that's my tongue Flavor twister. again. That's Flavor. my tongue twister for the night. Favorite slasher franchise. Favorite slasher franchise. Favorite slasher franchise. Okay. It's a little tough. Yeah, I get it. You nailed it. First well, try. Well, that being it's said, not that difficult. Why don't we get into our sponsors real quick, Pete? All right, Jamie, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking, it's from Mazatlan, Mexico. You may have seen it before on this episode. It is a cerveza. It is Pacifico. La Cerveza del Pacifico. Just like your hat, dude. I'm going to be in that center of attention. Hell yeah, dude. No, I just actually, I wore a beanie and it's way too fucking hot in here to wear a beanie. And I have this hat yeah, stuck no. on the back of my backpack. Like you uh, just closed in our last episode, we are in podcasting in hell. So that's why it's too sure. hot to wear a beanie. Sure. I, and Pete, in honor of, uh, let's see, like all of the Diddy feud that is going on, maybe the guys, you know, there was, there was bad boy records with Diddy, but on the West Coast, we had. Death Row Records, who maybe are the good guys in this whole thing. Should not. Controversial opinion there, but uh, we'll see. Anyways, we got Death Row Records, Happy Dad, Grape Seltzer. I was I always sided with the, the West Coast, dude. I was always a Tupac Dre guy. Is that real? What? Oh, dude, I'm way more East Coast. Really? Yeah, for sure. I like Tupac, but Tupac, Ice Cube, Dre, I, like, I just didn't like the G-Funk. I like the grittiness and the rawness of you like of East Coast. You like to hip hop. You like Puff Daddy. No, I didn't like when he. You liked when he took all those kids and did bad things with them. No, dude, that's exactly what you did. Yep, Tupac for life. I didn't like that. Still alive. Westside. 
Don't do don't do gang signs. You yeah, gotta go we're gonna get us killed. What else you got? There looks like there's something in the middle here. All right. So we mentioned that uh, we are going to be covering the Halloween franchise tonight. Okay. So in honor of the naughtiest uncle in the history of slasher movies, I say that's is that fair? There's a lot of naughty uncles, but I think that he might be the worst. He does kill a lot of people. I think that he qualifies as the worst. We have Uncle Nearest, who is apparently the uncle of Jack Daniels. We are drinking a Tennessee small batch bourbon. Uh, He was Jack Daniels' uncle, and apparently Jack Daniels stole his recipe from him. Of course he did. Where did you find this? This is wonderful news. I've never heard of this. I found it at Ski House Liquor. Oh, cool. Yep. Just all the name, you're like, oh, that's naughty. No, no the, uh, the cashier made sure to tell me the entire story, because we went in. The person I was with was like, give us a good whiskey. We need something good. And uh, That's a weird way to portray someone. It is not the person you think it is, and that's why it's oh, funnier. Oh, okay. Okay. So, anyways, she's like, oh, well, have you, like, we, you've tried this whiskey? And I'm like, yeah, I've tried that. And she's like, have you tried this whiskey? Like, literally, all these whiskeys I've had, we've tried on this on this podcast already for the most part if not bartending or whatever mm-hmm. but she's like oh and this is from apparently the recipe is jack daniel's uncle this is his recipe and apparently jack daniel stole the recipe and made his own whiskey out of his recipe and was just more successful with it so i was like well shit i guess we'll try that one two things it's way better than jack daniel's i, I agree with that so sorry three things i line them up. i like this better than jack daniel's too yeah. Second thing, Dagnalls. Second thing is, I really thought there was going to be a cool story involving Michael Myers about this, and there wasn't. Nope, it's just naughty uncles, dude. So that is the most uncle thing to do is to just bitch about your <laughs> nephew, <laughs> your nephew stealing your shit, stealing your shit. I fucking told him how to do this. I taught him everything he knew. All right. So cheers to Uncle Nearest. Nearest. 1984. Although I'm pretty sure Jack Daniels was around way before that, but. Hey, whatever. Well, that, are you cheering me again? Or? Yes, yeah, sure. Skull. Skull. Well, I think if you're thinking what I'm thinking, it's time for Hell on Earth. It's, it's time for Hell on Earth. So I don't know if you remember about eight months ago in Grand Junction, they found a head and hands. In a- yeah, in the fridge or in the freezer. This is like our would, first episode. They would have found that way quicker. Wow. So, you remember that? Yeah, but what, wasn't it, was it outside of someone's house, or was it in the house that someone knew had moved into? Yes. Okay, in that's what it was. That okay. Someone recently bought, and they opened up a chest freezer in the basement and found a head. And <laughs> hands. So, they identified that body. Um, no shit. Yeah. Really? With head and hands, they were able to identify whose fucking body it was? This is the future. I'm sorry to be an asshole, but, like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Why? Because it's been, like, months. You what? have literal hands to fingerprint with and a whole head to identify someone with. I, are the teeth missing? That's the only thing that could be missing. First of all. They're like, man, we're missing the hip bone. We can't identify who it is. You don't know how hard they worked on this. I don't. Sitting in your chair, listening to podcasts and murder, it might seem really easy to just identify people. But obviously, the great city of Grand Junction had a little bit harder time with it, and it took them eight months. The Grand City of Great Junction. So let me, I'm going to get into this. And then you're going to, like, swallow your pride a little bit okay. because you... Sorry, I'm not letting you continue. I, I want you to. You're going to feel like an asshole Let's go. for all this. Quick snippets about it. Six-year-old girl has not been seen since 2005, so they're 20 years old. So that's probably what took them a little bit of time, wouldn't you say? Wait. Yep. The body was identified as a 20-year-old person? Nope. Or the remains are 20 years old? The remains are 20 years old. Why? 16 year old girl. Six. L- 16. Oh, 16. You gotta listen. That's why, I, that's why I yell at you. I'm, I'm gonna listen back and I just said 16. So, sorry. Let me start over again. A 16 year old girl last seen in 2005. It's fucking nuts. So, a bunch of stuff says, so yeah, 
someone that bought the house found this freezer and the plot twist is is this girl parents used to own this house no yep dude i don't like that you don't like the fact that maybe her parents murdered her and stuff and then put her in a freezer wait so were the parents the last owners or was there an owner in between i don't know that i can read this real i feel like it'd be nuts if there was someone that owned it in between and also like are you just that dispassionate or did like the parents maybe die or something and it was like sold in like an estate other than that I don't know how you end up just leaving behind your child's body. If you murdered him. If you murdered him. So if you know, or even if you didn't, maybe she passed away from natural and then you naturally and you're like, hey, I want to keep her with us. No, because then why would just her hands and her head? So if you don't mind, I'm going to read you a little bit from this ABC News, all the good stuff from Disney. So the head in the hands of a 16 year old girl who was last seen in 2005, have been discovered in a freezer by someone who was collecting the free appliance by the new owner of a recently sold home, Leaf said. The the incident initially took place nine months ago on January 12th when the Mesa County Sheriff's Office in Colorado received a call regarding a suspicious incident in 29 block of Pinyon Avenue and Grand Junction, approximately 240 miles west of Denver. Who cares? Colorado border, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Upon arrival, deputies found the head and the hands of the human had been discovered in a freezer by someone who arrived to claim their free appliance. Repeating yourself. Blah, blah, blah. Through DNA testing, the victim is identified as Amanda Laurel Overstreet. Law enforcement announced Amanda is believed to have approximately 16 years old at the time of her disappearance. Overstreet has not been seen or heard from since April 2005. Overstreet was the biological daughter of the previous owner of the home. Police said, and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance remain under investigation as no shit. Ongoing forensic testing of evidence. There's no record that Amanda Overstreet was ever reported missing. Officials said, "Was that okay? That was great. Are you proud of yourself for being able to not like talk? Like you had to like listen for a little bit, and you did. I'm really proud. Yeah, no. And I wanted to call timeout. And the only reason I was was wanting to call timeout is because wait." So, the body wasn't even, dis- or like the head and the hands weren't even discovered by the people that bought the house? No. I don't, yeah, I mean, I guess I really have no idea how any of this went down. It just seems crazy to me that, one, the girl is in there in the first place. Yeah. Two, she lived there, so the parents at least knew about it, would be my understanding, unless this is some weird shit that, like, they're putting her body back where she came from kind of thing. I don't think that's probably the case. Three, that the parents forgot that they had the daughter in the ice chest? Okay. No, we don't know anything. Four. These are all questions we don't know. Four, these people moved into the house and they found this ice chest and then they put it up for sale? For free. Okay, okay. Well, I'm sure if they knew it was in it, it was up for free. Like, You're not going to charge for that shit. Ah, gross. Yeah, so- and the person that discovered this whole thing was someone that showed... We live in this town. Things go up for free all the time. You go and you pick up a nice, like, a, a nice fucking freezer, and you're like, hell yeah, man, like, free freezer? I'll go pick that shit up. You open that shit up, finally, and there's a fucking girl's head and hands inside and you con like no i don't know who i contact first the people that i just picked it up from or the police definitely the cops i think the cops are first but like you gotta contact the people that gave you the freezer in the first place right hey man and they're like hey we don't know we got this free freezer there's a fucking kid's head in it hey man you know anything about it why'd you give it to me That's a wild, like, the whole thing is fucking crazy. I'm sure you're going to keep us updated on this. I hope you will. Um, anything else? That's a fucking wild turn of events. Sure is. Holy shit. Can't make this shit up, folks. You definitely can't. Wow. Um, What do you got, Pete? Mine is, I think, potentially a more silly story, but it's still developing, so I don't really, kind of like yours, we have a decent amount of information but there's still some things that could potentially throw some 
what, what do you mean? The, what's the term? What term are you talking about? I don't know. It, this this thing could be just so. Anyways, let me know. Tell this us is the story. The mean material. story of the Ohio rug lady. Have you seen anything about this? Not a not all right. Thing. So there is this. I'm gonna call her like. She's not a mom fluencer, but I think that's what I would call her. But anyways, yeah, she's a TikTok person. I don't go on TikTok, but this came across Reddit. We know, and it, and so then I started to dig into it. Okay, so this lady first so she has this video series that's on her page okay and the first video she's like i don't know what happened but i this is my office and i work it's like this like big sunroom on her place this is in cleveland ohio okay yep no it's in columbus actually okay. columbus ohio so she's like i left this room yesterday everything was in place i came in today we close the door when i leave here it's my office and the computer screen, for sure, completely broken, right? And she's like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. All my things are moved around in this built, like, in my office here. There's, it, she has a bunch of weird things that are, like, very particular to her. Okay. And she's like, we're also building this fence around our house. She has these two big dogs that they're building this fence to keep their dogs in. And we were digging post holes, and we came across a rug that was buried two feet deep in the back of our yard. So that's like the first video. And then sh from there, she starts getting people interested through TikTok and they start telling her what to do. And so people are like, hey, it's a ghost that broke your computer because she has this other story where I swear like I, my kid went to bed and his phone was plugged in and then we woke up the next morning and it wasn't plugged in anymore, and it was at 3%, which is, like, what's ridiculous. This, what's this lady's name? You know? I looked up Ohio Rug Lady. It's yeah, Katie... Yeah. Here, let me... I have it here. I'm trying Katie Santry, S-A-N-T-R-Y. TikTok is like, hey, one, we think you have a ghost. Two, you should call the cops about this rug that you found. And so she does. And police come over, they investigate, and they kind of also think that it's weird. They radio their police chief, and, like, apparently he says that they don't have the resources to, like, put any money into this. So she decides that she's going to fucking dig up the rug. Because of course. for some reason, there's this reveal to where the day that she moved into this house, so she's a stepmom, her husband or boyfriend has kids the day that she moved in is also the day that their neighbor was found dead the exact same day that the windows were boarded up on her dead neighbor's house is the day that all of this shit happened the computer got broken and they found this rug this lady was an old lady so it was like not a huge deal she goes on for a while talking about hey we're gonna dig up the rug and like she doesn't really like it's literally like three or four videos in a row of her being like hey we're gonna dig up the rug hey we're digging up the rug yeah, dude, dig up the rug then she contacts the real estate agency to figure out who owned the house before them and it was like apparently the super nice normal family that didn't have anything nefarious going on so she finally eventually is like hey i have a contractor showing up to dig up the rug they're coming at 4 30 and apparently on that same day she is contacted by detectives who bring over cadaver dogs so like i should say while this whole thing is going on she's kind of someone like us that was like maybe sensationalizing it a little bit she's into true crime she's into horror type things and she's like maybe there's a dead body and maybe this is like something's buried in my backyard and kind of making jokes about it and then the police con these detectives and homicide detectives contact her and they bring over cadaver dogs and they immediately she has like she live streamed it they hit exactly where the rug is like that's exact like both of the dogs they have two separate occasions i guess that they go in and they hit immediately on where this rug is so then the police are like okay fuck you can't dig up like this is now a crime scene we have to investigate this thing so this is happening within i think the rug was actually dug up by police on the 18th of October, so I don't have a ton of answers going forward, but it is being processed by crime scene investigators and forensic anthropologists to go through and like see what they can find on the fibers of this rug. I don't know. Rug Lady was an interesting little, like, maybe innocent, but maybe not. So all it is is they think that this rug is a ghost, 
has ghosts in it? I don't know what the tie-in is. I think the tie-in with the ghost has more to do with the fact... I mean, I think it was kind of her cell. It's a weird thing where it may be a true crime story. It also may just be a viral internet story that like really has no substance and couldn't could possibly be absolutely nothing being made up by the person like it's all about how you tell the story and she's saying like the whole thing didn't even start with the hole the hole was like kind of secondary to this computer being broken and then she's like oh yeah i forgot to mention that this happened and this happened it's like a really strange bizarre story but she was like before the police showed up she's like if they hit this is the craziest thing like i couldn't even imagine i was just a normal person that was trying to like make a funny video about a ghost being here and then i showed that there was a a piece of carpet stuck in my backyard and now she's like i may be in the middle of like a true crime story that like i didn't even intend to be in so i just think it was like an interesting story that combines true crime as well as the internet and how the internet can easily blow things completely out of proportion she spends multiple videos just yelling at people for yelling at her about making this whole thing up you don't explain yourself to me dude i watch a lot of tiktok this is like the whole world of tiktok it's, it really is and it's why I, like i can't do tiktok it makes me think about that guy that like talked about his own the owner of the restaurant mm-hmm. like killing pe- killing animals and, and the whole like, thing was completely made up all yeah so is that all you had about the crazy? So I'll keep crazy. Just like, like you're gonna may not know. Well, police are processing, so like they literally have they showed like she showed the video of like tune in next week if to figure out about the ghost drug. Yeah, dude, ghost drug could be real. Ghost drug could be total bullshit. Hashtag I'm gonna ghost drug 2024. I'm gonna say preemptively. I think it's probably bullshit. Yeah, but a, I think that it's no, ridiculous. It's, it's, well, but like you never know, dude. There's a like, and they like. Show the police removing the rug out of this thing, and it's like a big fucking, it's like an area rug that's fucking like five feet fucking long, and like, who cares? It's crazy, dude. <laughs> if anything happens with it, you will, listeners will let you know. Okay, I hope, I hope something happens with this later. All right, I'm going to keep rolling into horror news, because your horror news, horror news is going to be better than mine, I think. Okay. We also watched a whole bunch of Halloween movies, but we so still, many fucking hell. still managed to go and watch something else. And I had the time to go and watch Smile 2 the other night. And all I can say is it completely blew the first movie out of the water. Really? Yes. Because I liked the first one. I, I liked the first one, too. My only issue with the first one is how much they overhyped it they also just like it was overly reliant on jump scares and now going back like we just did a whole this whole episode is going to be reviewing like a franchise of horror movies yeah really examining how like cinematography and the effects are used it was definitely an over like the jump scare was what made the movie the movie well, and yeah. the marketing yeah for sure yeah, so the marketing is what I was trying to get to. There was no it, marketing on this one. No. They literally, I think... Hardly they, at all. I think they realized that they, like, over overshot the marketing, which I thought... Like, they probably, overhyped it, so well, people it was, were expecting more? Yeah, it was smart that what they did, because I don't think if you put out a movie called Smile, like, it would have been as big of a... It's a plus film, dude. It's yeah. gonna be fucking huge no matter what. Hold on. I think by overhyping it, they got more people to watch it. But I think by overhyping it, they also made it like where people were pissed off because it wasn't to their expectations. Yeah. Just like how we did with Long Legs. Yes, but they've also like they've set up the franchise of a Smile, however fucking many they want to make, or whatever branches they want to go in. Because the first one was such like everyone saw that movie, and everyone has their own opinion. But even if you don't fucking like a movie, you most likely still watch the second one. Yes. And going into it, you know, I thought, like, then, you know, it's just got to be Smile. And this this movie was fucking phenomenal. Really? I, That's awesome. You, I think you know this about me, that I'm a pretty anxious person. Yeah. And this movie, I was fucking, like, Edgy I was feet. so anxious. Yeah. I just, like, felt for this girl. And, it was like, and then, like at the end, I was like, "This is a, gr- a phenomenal ending, really, to this movie." Yep. See, I think that's where like 
I thought that the movie, the first, the, the first smile was good. And then I thought the ending went maybe a little off the rails, like got a lot of crazy. And you're saying that they kind of remedied that and like really delivered with the ending. I thought the ending was, That's, was well, since, super, it was awesome. So I highly encourage anyone that likes horror to watch Smile 2. All right. We'll have to check it out. You should. It's not your dumb idiot. All right. In my horror news, I watched uh, Woman of the Hour. You said that your sister talked to you about this? Yeah, but I, I, I have still yet to see anything other than the fact that I know that, like, who directed it. That's so, I know about it. through, like, lots of podcasts, I've stuff like that, I've known the story of Rodney Alcala. Um, I remember when this movie was being made, I remember seeing, like, posts about, there's a movie being made about a dating game killer who is, yeah, like I just mentioned, Rodney Alcala. Anyways, Woman of the Hour, it's the directorial debut for Anna Kendrick, who is pretty fucking awesome. And I think, I don't know if I've seen anything that I haven't, like, enjoyed her being a part of. I know you were really into the Pitchburg Perfect movies. Yeah, for sure. So, yep. Um, see why this segued right into that. Yeah, it really worked for me to tie her directly into the Pitch Perfect movies. Yeah, because, uh, go on. Anyways, it's all a performance. So, Woman of the Hour tells the story of several women who have come into contact with the dating game killer named Rodney Alcala. This movie, however, was not what I expected. Um, when I went into it, I was thinking, this is going to be another like biopic type of movie where we get to see the story of the killer and know their like backstory and why they do what they do. Um, and we don't get that. Instead, we focus primarily on the victims or the potential victims. Potential victim being like the most important person who is Anna Kendrick. She plays this character, Cheryl Bradshaw, who is... So the dating game is three men and one woman. And she asks them these questions. At the end of all of these, like, there's three rounds of questions that they pretty much go through. It's a really cheesy 70s TV show. And it's the true story of this woman and the victims also of the serial killer Rodney Alcala. The movie focuses on the interactions between Alcala and his victims or the potential victims. And I think this movie was more about or le like less about the story of a serial killer and more about a story between men and women and the relationships and dynamics between the sexes. Do tell. So while it takes place in the 70s, the ideas expressed in this film are just as prevalent, if not more so, today, specifically with power struggles, both physically as well as, I don't know what you want to call it, institutionally. I wanted to say that this movie makes sense coming from someone like Anna Kendrick, who is in like the Hollywood trenches, especially now being a director. But I think she continues. She's someone that would face lots of misogyny and even be confronted with feelings of fear and stuff from her like, male counterparts. But I think it's not so much just Anna Kendrick is the right person to tell this story. I think this is like, it's a woman's story about how women are in this place. And they even bring it up in like one of the questions in the, in the movie where they're like, what are women for? And none of the men really have a good answer because like, they don't really know. The only person that maybe kind of has a good answer even though it's like completely nefarious in its own end is women are for whatever she wants to be for kind of thing is what the serial killer answers that's not giving away a ton but the movie was i expected it to be this just biopic about another serial killer and it was much more than that and a lot deeper than that and i thought that it was a really really good film so i'm not i don't think i ruined anything there it's just i'm really confused on what the movie is actually about other than the serial killer and a game show. Yep. And then women, mm -hmm. women and men, and women being subjective or subjected. Yeah. Mm, subjected, also like objective, like objectified also at the same time. All right. Um, I think they like, yeah, it's, it wasn't actually as much of like a horror movie. It was, I would say a drama. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe like a thriller a little bit because there are certainly some like graphic scenes. But for the most part, it was about the relationships between men and women and how those like manifest. Okay. So yeah, really cool. Um, Anna Kendrick, excellent work. What's it called again? Women of the Hour. Women of the Hour. Woman, sorry. Woman of the Hour. Woman of the Hour. 
Um, yeah. So there's that. No, great. I thought it was There's a kick-out great film. stuff going on there. I'm going to have to check it out. Yeah. You watch that. I'm going to watch. You should. I'm super pumped fucking for it. awesome. It was fucking awesome, dude. I think with that, I Jamie. Tell you, I wanted to tell you so much more, but I want to keep it mystery. Like, yeah, don't. Go watch, the th- go watch the trailers. I think. Shit. I mean, and I hope I didn't give too much away on Woman of the Hour. No, you just. Kept, I think I. I you kind of ran around in a circle for a little bit. I just got kind of confused. The themes of you kind of confused me for a little bit. Yeah, I didn't tell a story. Movie. I told themes. Yeah. yeah. So. With that being said, are you ready to go into the main event? With with, with, with all things to do, or what is what do you say? I don't even remember what I say. With all things that are. With that ado. Without ado. I'll say it. Let's get into this main event. We have a... We're going to take a quick piss break because we have to change into costumes. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. We can call it a piss break, but... We decided to choose our favorite non-relevant character in the Halloween franchise to dress up as. And so, that being said, we're going to go take pee breaks, and we're going to dress up into these characters. And we'll see you right back. Yeah, dude. Well, get over here, dude. I'm ready. You still have the hat on. <laughs> oh, that's good, dude. Can you guess who I am? Uh, yeah, you're fucking, uh, it's not Annie. Too fat. I'm too fat. I will hold. I'm going to put my hat back on so you don't see how. What's her name? You can tell me. I'm pretty sure her official name is Nurse. I am the hot nurse. Hot nurse. From Halloween 2. From Halloween 2, dude. In the jacuzzi. Sick. Who are you? I'm Barry Sims, dude. I'm the shock jock from Halloween 6. Of course he does. <laughs> 1-800-SUG. <laughs> I'm the shock jock. Brilliant. Yeah, dude. I did. I was. I was going to have a fedora, but... They didn't have one, so... I like how both of us are just not wearing clothes. Yeah, dude. I'm still going to wear my hat, even though she does. Yeah. She doesn't say so have to see how I work. To my- well, and I told you I was going to be the ghost, and I wish I honestly, like, because when I decided I was going to do that, I was like, man, like, it was just so good in the first Halloween, and then I had literally, as soon as I decided that it wasn't good, I watched Rob Zombie's Halloween. And he's back again, and then he's also back a third time in the third Halloween. Which ghost? In Rob Zombies and the original, it's it's not an actual ghost. It's just someone wearing a bed sheet, like a white yeah. sheet with glasses. And then in Halloween 2018, the or is that? Yeah, no, yeah, it's it's in Halloween 2018. One of the there's a character that's I think it's one of the boyfriends is like killed and then has the sheet over over him with glasses on yeah uh, he's in all three that would have been a great one too. in all three halloween movies um there is the person with sheet and glasses and i was gonna be that but i felt this is a video podcast and i felt like that was kind of lame i like just this. put a sheet no, yeah it'd have been great it'd have been hard to talk in a sheet people thought you were racist <laughs> Yeah, and I don't, I don't need that. All right. With that being said, welcome back. Can you let's go into this main event? We kind of talked about who we are. I'm gonna keep my hat on. Yeah, dude, keep, keep your hat on. Keep your hat on. Is that a song? I don't yeah, know that song. The Mountie. The Mountie. The full Mountie. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, we've talked about it a couple times already. But we are covering the Halloween franchise and its entirety which is a massive endeavor Are you so proud of us? i'd say we pretty much what i was asking them if they're proud of us oh are you proud of us i'm proud of us i'm proud of us yeah dude i watched a lot of horror this art this month already like we we watched 
what, 13 movies in 14 days? Some of us watched 13. Other of us watched 12. Right? You don't need to go there. I do. Well, love that for you. Thanks. All righty. Jamie, oh, we're going to start out. My boobs are coming in. Dude. Dude. Keep, keep the girls down. All right. Um, we're going to start with Halloween 1979. So, or sorry, 78. I think what we should do is we're going to run through and pretty much just do some quick information, facts, and then we'll go through kind of plot line, and then we'll have a little discussion after for each movie. Does that work for you? Sounds great to me. All right. Halloween 1978. This is the first one, the big one. Director John Carpenter releases 1978. Key plot points. Michael Myers kills his sister. True. Does not kill his parents. No. Nope. After 15 years in confinement, he ex- he escapes from Smith's Grove Sanitarium and returns to his home field of Haddonfield, Illinois. He stalks high school student Lori Strode and her friends while being pursued by psychiatrist Dr. Sam Loomis, who is who knows the danger that Michael possesses. The film culminates in a terrifying showdown on Halloween night where Lori fights for her life and Dr. Loomis tries to stop Michael. Got anything else plot point wise you need to add there? Plot point? Yep. No, I think you sweet kind of covered it. And I did like really, really basic, like quickly moving through these. I'm sure. All right, what'd you think of Halloween 7, 1978? How does it hold up against like modern horror films? It's revolutionary. It's still, they still try to recreate it and they'll never be able to. Yeah. I'm sure you were going to talk about it already, mm-hmm. but I'm going to just throw it already out there. The Go. fact that. John Carpenter wanted to make this movie and completely have no blood in it. I was not going to talk about that. Yeah, so he, he his main point is he wanted a thriller that didn't need to use blood to scare people. So he wanted this to be more of a psychological serial killer theory where he was constantly stalking and didn't have to use the time where everything was about blood and guts. Did he have, like, I mean, I... Was there any blood? Zero blood. Zero blood. Okay. I didn't know if he like ended up like kind of caving on that. Okay. He also, which you may not agree with this, but I think that artistically this is a phenomenal part of this movie, is the subtle use of boobs. Yeah. That starting in this movie and for a lot of the franchise where it's non sex related boobs as you can see as i'm dressed they definitely get into that later for sure uh, i think what you're talking about is something that we should define off the bat because i'm going to be using the term quite frequently exploitation film uh, what that is going to be is usually in the horror genre things that dig into modern trends as well as things that are maybe taboo sex drugs alcohol for sure blood murder, these kinds of things that kind of became staple for especially 80s and 90s horror movies were like the definition of an exploitation film. And I'm not going to say that this series didn't go that way because I think that it 100% did. First, this one was intentionally, in my opinion, not meant to be an exploitation film. Yes, you see a little boob here and there, but it's not meant to be like the seller of the movie it's meant to like i don't actually really know why they were in there because they didn't have to be at all subtle boobs yep subtle boobs subtle boobs it, it, it situations where you don't think boobs should be there interesting like in the bedroom there were a couple of bedroom there were a bedroom yeah. boobs for sure but it wasn't like hey we're it wasn't grotesque it wasn't, it wasn't like top. hey we're banging it was like hey i'm laying there yeah. grab me a beer getting people like we talked about like when we first started this podcast where sometimes the draw is that there's tits in the first five minutes. Mm -hmm. This was not one of those things. Yes, there was some side boob or some subtle boob, as you would call it, but it was not anything gratuitous. And it wasn't, hey, watch this movie, you'll be able to see some boob. Yeah, that's that's Friday the 13th. 100%. Friday the 13th, Nightmare as well. Mm -hmm. Although, I think that those came later. I don't think the first ones did, but... Anyways, I agree with you. I love this movie. Uh, I think that it sets the groundwork for the entire horror genre going forward. Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street. It developed the slasher genre and almost all of the horror tropes that later get made fun of in movies like Scream mm-hmm. come specifically from this one movie. And there's a reason for that because it was so good. It was so revolutionary and it really like put horror in the place that i think it is today 
Well, just like how it was like a stalker, almost yep. a stalker film. Yep. Not just like a serial killer movie. Like he was, Michael Myers is in, or I guess, dare I say, The Shape, was in broad right. daylight. Good call there. Yeah. All the time, like following Lori. Yeah, you see him a lot. And I you think see that- him behind the bush. Yep. You see him behind the sheet. Those are the two, like, probably most iconic those things of the whole movie, correct? Another, yeah. Yeah, of course. I think the biggest, like, one of the biggest reasons why this film was so successful is because it was not gratuitous, but it had this sense of impending doom and this tension that, like, you knew something was going to happen, like you're talking about, where Michael Myers is in lots of these scenes whether or not he's active in them or a passive person in them, he is in them and it creates this tension and this suspense that for a budget of $300,000 could not have created the movie that they wanted to make if they didn't. The reason why the movie is so good is because of suspense. Mm -hmm. It keeps you waiting for something to happen and you just never quite know when it's going to happen which makes it scarier 100% I love this my favorite horror movies are the ones that keep you on the edge of your seat being like no he's right fucking there when is he going to get her and then he doesn't but you know that he's right around the corner because you see him go from right behind her like the to back outside again the or dare scene yep yeah that's why so yeah I, I think that I'm right there with you. This movie, the first time I saw it, I was not a huge fan of. Like we talked about, it. I'm a product of like late 2000s horror, mm -hmm. which is like very gratuitous, and I would say like for the most part exploitative. Those. This is how I got into horror, and like I was also let's call a late bloomer for horror. You know, I remember my first movie that I specifically remember watching that was a horror movie was The Descent, which I think came out in 2007. I could be wrong there. Really? Yeah. It was the first horror movie I saw, and I loved it. And I, and I still love it. I have a podcast with you? Yeah. Horror? Well, yeah, but I dug you in real hard. Seven? Dug in real hard. But, so this movie, the first time I saw it, was like, man, like, I get it, but, like, at the same time, it's kind of boring. And if you're not approaching this movie from, in my opinion, an artistic view, I can see why it would be considered yeah. boring. There's about 45 minutes in the middle of the movie that really nothing happens. But that doesn't mean that they're not building suspense there. If you learn to appreciate what John Carpenter has done with his camera work and the lighting and all of that in this movie, it makes the movie so much better. And that's what I got to get this time around through this whole franchise, being able to appreciate what the directors and what the cinematographers are actually doing to make the story scarier to make this a real awesome horror movie yeah and some of them were good some of them were not all right you ready for another question yeah all right john carpenter's music is very minimalistic mm -hmm. how do you think that, that ties in with this film it made it made it made it spooky right like, i remember thinking about it in a few movies is it the most iconic yes horror theme yes it's got to be right 100 percent the Exorcist right. doesn't come close. No. Adam's family. No. What's a little note that even well, counts? It's like the Friday the 13th, like, noises. Yeah, but there's not, like, a, a music to that. You know, Freddy has his, like, you know, it opens up with the one, two. Yeah. Like, which is, like, creepy. He also... Mostly because it's sung by children. But this is just music that is, like, it puts you weirdly on edge. Freddy also had Will Smith wrote a song about him, so that's kind of a big deal, too. I don't know if you've ever heard Nightmare on My Street. I don't think I have. Actually, no, that's not true. I've, you've shown it to me. Yeah. Yep. But I think, yes, the Halloween theme song is the horror theme song yep. of, Agreed. of horror. It's literally my, my cell phone theme song. So it is, I think, at most, five notes. Yes. Right? Not counting the background chords, yeah. I thought that it was, like, I'm just going to juxtapose, or, like, not juxtapose, but mention that, like, the minimalism of that theme works really well with the minimalism of the movie, where it's not trying to be something bigger than it is, right? Yeah. It's very minimalistic, but it gets to the point of your, like, kind of your, your soul, your heart. It, like, it 
with very little done gets to the point. Your heart soul, I get it. Yep. All right. Character arcs. Yep. How do we like character development throughout the film? We're going to start with Dr. Loomis. How he develops through the whole movie? Yeah, well, what do we think about Dr. Loomis as a character? Because, like, his arc is going to span quite a few movies. Here. Yeah, it's, it's hard to answer from just the first one. Yeah. Because I know him from so many. Yep. Um, I could tell you he was kind of obnoxious for the first one. For sure. And just, but he was like, he was warning everyone about what was really could happen. I just felt bad for him because he's like, hey, no, none of you fuckers are listening to me. I'm trying to tell you evil incarnate is here and none, no one wants to believe me. He also had the chance to shoot Michael Myers. Yeah, we get into that later. What do you think about Laurie's character development? There wasn't much. You don't think so? Not in this one, no. Yeah. I think she was just like... Mm. I guess that's fair. She was just like the shy girl, and she was babysitting. She was calling her friends that were also babysitting, and they happened to die, and she didn't. Yeah. It's kind of what we got out of the first one. I agree. How about Michael? We get a lot of character development there? No. We get... I him, also him, agree. Him as a kid. Barely. Clown costume. Barely. Like, no, no, and, it's just like him holding But knife, we do like, need to mention, all right. Like the iconic knife of this. We do need to mention, there was, remember this summer when uh, In a Violent Nature came out? Yes. And it was the most revolutionary thing because it's, the story is seen through the eyes of the killer. Mm -hmm. Halloween's been doing this for fucking 40 years now, exactly. dude. Exactly. This is nothing new. It, it, like, and like, I was hyped for that too. Well, and I, like, I'm watching like, this and I'm like, this is not new. This is literally was done in 79. Well, they definitely have scenes in that movie or in the original Halloween where you see the first, the view of. Them. Yeah. It's, it's the first person viewpoint. Yeah. The, literally the first scene in the movie is a huge long shot mm -hmm. and we'll get to it eventually talking a little bit more about Michael's, let's call it compartmentalism. But in that first scene, as we are POV. Do we, like, pay any attention to the fact that we don't see Michael's sister actually getting stabbed? We just see the knife raising and then disappearing out of the camera. Mm -hmm. I think it's important because, as we'll get into later, I think the mask has a lot to do with uh, how Michael processes things. The second movie we're going to talk about, obviously, will be Halloween 2 in 1981, directed by Rick Rosenthal. This movie, in some ways, is viewed as literally just the longer version of Halloween 1. It's supposed to be one long movie, mm -hmm. right? And we'll get into the director stuff. Anyways, directly following the events of the fir first film, Lori is taken to Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, where she struggles to survive after being attacked by Michael. Michael, meanwhile, continues his killing spree, searching for Lori, leading to a terrifying series of events inside that actual hospital that Lori's already in. The film also does a quick little reveal that Lori is Michael's sister, which is adding a complex layer to their connection. At the end, Dr. Loomis sets the entire room slash hospital where both him and Michael are uh, on fire, and Michael stumbles out of that, and we're kind of left a little bit in, uh, we, we don't exactly know what happens, correct? Correct. I'm trying to think. I thought Loomis got sh or died in this one. He does not. I mean, technically, he doesn't die. But because yeah, we see yeah. him in every film after this, but he's fucked up. I thought they like he got stabbed or shot. Well, he's definitely stabbed. Michael fucks him up, but then he also sets fire. Literally, blows the fuck up. Yes, in the room with Michael. You're you're missing. Also, you, you didn't talk about the. The, the scene in the hospital where I where my character was. Oh, we'll get there. These are just like literally key plot points. Michael's on his rampage, literally just killing everyone. What'd you think of Halloween 2? I loved it. I fucking loved this movie. I thought I thought it was brilliant because yeah. usually they try to like build up. Usually sequels are like a completely different entity from the first one. And like what you said earlier, how this was yeah, you're literally smack dab right into the end of the first movie, and it just goes on. Yep. 
Yeah, it's it's it's, was it's not clever. later. It's literally the first Eight. like four scenes of the movie are just recapping what the fuck happened in the last movie. There were some funny scenes where like you see for some reason in the first one, Michael falling out the window after being shot, he lands directly onto the ground, whereas in this one he distinctly lands on a crash pad. So apparently they didn't use the same footage, which I thought it was very interesting. I didn't even notice that. It's really bad. But no, this movie I think in my opinion it played into the more exploitative parts. Not over the top. It leaned into like what I like in my horror movies, which is you have some creative kills. You have some good story. The thing that I struggled with that I kind of now have like come to grips with makes Michael better is that in the first one he had no reason for what he was doing right yeah he just the reason why he chooses Lori in the first one is because Lori's dad is a real estate agent and he asks her to put the key under the mat at his old home yes right and if the second one doesn't get made that explains him as the sister we assume that Michael is just killing at will because he needs to no reason yeah right Whereas, and I think that upon further reflection going through this whole series, I think that that is so much better. Mm -hmm. But watching this the first time through, I remember being like, why the fuck is he killing all these people? Like, it doesn't make any sense. There's no reason for it. And the second one gives you the reason he has to kill his sister, right? He has a reason for what he's doing. He has to kill his sister, who you realize in the second one is his sister. So I thought that this was a fucking kick-ass movie. It has creative kills, has some boobies, has some more exploitative, some partying, and then also just like some crazy shit going. It also on features end. blood. Yep, has more blood. But as like as the first one had zero blood, this one went straight into killing people and showing blood. Yeah, no, there was like where yeah, the so first one took the... a long time to get to the kills. This one wasted no time at oh, all. Oh yeah, it's because it was literally carrying on. All right, so we kind of gone through that. How does the hospital setting make the horror dynamic like more interesting compared to the first film? I don't have a good answer for you for that. Do you have an answer for it? I just thought that like it added a little extra stress because these characters are trapped, right? They're like stuck in a cage with Michael Myers, and like it's like no matter what you do, you can't get out. Like they can't. No, everyone tries to leave the hospital. And Michael is, like, blowing up cars or, like, doing flat tires or whatever the fuck. Killing anyone that tries to fucking leave the hospital. He's got that shit locked down. It almost, like, and I get this feeling as we go on more. Not so much in the first one, but Michael is everywhere. He's, like, an ethereal being. You start to get superhuman Michael in this second one. He got fucked up in the first one. And, yes, he is not seen at the end of the first movie, but... He becomes this superhuman that we come to know him as in the second one. And I think it adds a whole nother layer of Michael Myers. Any standout moments? Obviously, no question. The best scene yeah. is fucking in the hot tub. That's why I was like, I don't know why there was like, why anyone was worried. They literally were talking about going and banging. Yeah. I, the only person I thought was really like nervous the whole time was Lori in the hospital. Yeah, no, Lori was and I well, think that we get like, to we get to see really? Lori kind of uh develop a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um she becomes more than just like like you said in the movie where she's just the fucking babysitter that just somehow miraculously survives and doesn't do that really of her own volition. Although she does kind of fuck him up in the first one. We get to see Lori and we will continue to see Lori as maybe other than my boy Buster Rhymes the only person that really actually fucks up Michael. Yeah. We'll get to that. Yes. Anyways, I fucking thought it was ridiculous and kind of like cool when at the very end they're in that room and Lori shoots Michael fucking twice in the eyeballs in each eye. Oh, I so then he's about just that. thrashing around like a fucking crazy person, which is why like she doesn't, she's able to escape and why Loomis is like, fuck this. Like we'll just do this shit now and we'll kill him. I forgot about that completely. Yep. I two shots, straight eyeball shots both times. Fucking spot on shooting, Lori. Good work. But we did get to see her starting to actually like be a formidable opponent for Michael. She does some like weird little tricky stuff that she'll continue to do as we keep going. It's the only thing that fucking works against him, it seems. 
Anyways, uh, anything else? Halloween 2. I fucking loved it. Ooh, me too. I think, yeah. Shaft's kiss. Yep. Halloween 3, bud. 1982, directed by Tommy Lee Wallace. This is the complete departure from the Michael Myers storyline. The film follows a mask maker, Silver Shamrock, whose masks contain a deadly secret thing. Tied to an ancient ritual, the protagonist, Dr. Daniel Chalice, uncovers the sinister plan as, er, as children across America begin to wear these silver shamrock masks, leading to a deadly Halloween night. You never see it. You don't. What'd you think of the movie? You know what I thought about it. See, I liked you liked it. it. I, I did not. So I think it would have been better if they wouldn't have called it Halloween 3. Okay, that's fair. And I think that you're not at all off by saying that. I I'll think that this it. movie was not a weak movie on its own. I think that being tied into the Halloween franchise, and there's obviously, we see the rest of the franchise Go reacting ahead. to it. It's it's not a Michael Myers story, so who the fuck cares? No, I went. they went straight back with their, they went over the top with Michael after that for four because to make up for the fact that how pissed off everyone was about Halloween. 3. Right. So, and we should caveat this. I'm sure you saw this. The Halloween franchise was meant to be like an anthology series yes. to where there was going to be all these, let's call it trick or treat on steroids, 100%. where there's all these little like stories that are happening. And like the first one was supposed to be called the babysitter killings. And then this was season of the witch. And I don't really totally know why they called it season of the witch. Cause I think that's even with this one, like a kind of dumb name, but we before we get too much into it i thought that it was a cool like 80s sci-fi horror i did think that i hated the doctor he's probably outside of ronnie in rob zombies halloween and then the it's not loomis but it's um the other doctor strode no 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 not the other doctor the piece of shit from it must be resurrection the really, really fucking ridiculous dad, I think it's from Resurrection, it is like super fucking nasty. No, it must be Halloween 6. It is Halloween 6, actually. You're confusing me. Anyways. Anyways, there's this really, really piece of shit dad. He's so, like, it's so like this electrocuted. Is your, you remember yeah, that guy? Yes, okay. Yeah. So this but, is, his, other than that, I hated this doctor so much, and he's your protagonist, so it's really hard to root for him. Because his face looks so stupid. He looks way too old to be banging that hot of a chick. Exactly. And, but like, not even that. Even like, his was face like, hey, doesn't look real. You're it's mine. so plastic. Yeah. It doesn't look real. It's spray tan. sent me. <laughs> He's like banging the chick. Your like, mom sent me here to look after you. What do you want? You know what I want. That's what I fucking hated. You're not a huge fan. I kind of am. Where does the visual style and special effects, how do they contribute to the film? Because I saw this and I was like, yo, this movie would be ridiculous to watch on drugs. Right? I also thought this is where the uh, Dupless or the Dunbar brothers. The Plast brothers. Whoever is in charge Creep? of Stranger Things. I don't know. It's something like Dublas or something. Yeah. I feel like a lot of their inspiration came from this movie. Like specifically, like the way that they use synthesizers, kind of show off like the parts where that were going to be suspenseful. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. I got out of like this, like Stranger Things. Okay, is get gets a lot from this. It had a lot of eighties style to it, and I thought that like yeah, eighties sci fi, eighties horror, the fucking like, most obnoxious soundtrack. Three more days till Halloween. Oh my god, fuck that. Three more days till Halloween, Silver Shamrock. Was awful. But I think that it literally fed into, like, this whole movie kind of fucking felt like a fever dream. To where everything was nonsense, and it was annoying, outrageous, and over the top. I thought that it was kind of good. I, I hated it. I don't like it. I think... I liked it just like I said, like it, it felt like a good 80s standalone movie. And that's what I, I approached it as. I did think that it got absolutely ridiculous. We have human sacrifice, not just human sacrifice, but also children. Um, there's an android army, right? He's making all these like robot people. Yes. Uh, we also have Stonehenge somehow is channeling these energies that are going to kill all the children, which doesn't. I, I think that that's a separate thing. 
I don't think that that counts into human sacrifice. And then there's also microchips that are like melting kids' brains. Where the, the witch thing come? was just like, the one guy. Witch. The one guy was like a warlock, right? I don't know. Kind of. Yes. Yeah, like Colonel Connell or something like that. Who cares? Let's move on. Okay. I, I'm going to run out of beer. We're going to go straight into the next one. All right. Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, directed by Dwight H. Little in 1988. This happens 10 years after the events of Halloween 2. Michael Myers awakes from a coma and escapes from uh, the hospital to Haddonfield, where he discovers that Laurie Strode has died and now tar- targets her young daughter. Jamie. Mm-hmm. The film follows Jamie and her, or her babysitter named Rachel as they attempt to evade Michael on Halloween night while the town descends into absolute chaos trying to find Michael. Uh, the film culminates in a final showdown between Michael and like everyone in Haddonfield who owns a gun and he gets shot like a hundred times. That's not the very end of the movie because what made this movie in my opinion, so good is the last 30 seconds of the film where we get a shocking ending where Jamie goes into the bathroom and stabs her foster mother, mm-hmm. hinting at a connection between her and Michael. Yes. What did you think of Halloween 4? I had a hard time remembering which one was which when it came to 4 and 5. Yeah. So I feel like it... Didn't have a huge you want me to clarify? impact. Yeah, would you? So this is the one where Jamie, the girl, mm-hmm. the young girl, is out trick or treating, and then they all go into the one house. Yes, she's wearing with the-, the police, or the police are in the house with her, where she's wearing the clown costume, the same clown costume that Michael, that Michael was wearing. Yep, and like the babysitter, Rachel, like falls off the fucking roof of the house and shit like that. You remember? I completely agree. It's all confusing through 4, 5, and 6. They all have the same kind of vibe and the same kind of cinematography and look to them that I think that they are very interchangeable. But this movie was so much better than the later ones. Yes. They also, it was a shit ton gorier. Yeah, he, to he, see like, some yeah pretty he was like walking up the stairs and he fucking gouges that guy's eyes out. Yep. Or just like straight stabbing someone with a shotgun. Well, you could be <laughs> definitely became a superhuman. Mm-hmm. Like, no just regular serial, serial killer could do that shit. Absolutely. Like, the first two movies, okay, yes, he's. He and we start to someone. see at the end of the second he's one. He's holding up, he's fucking tall. He's. He'll, like literally, just and now he's a monster. Murders. He's an an unstoppable monster. It, like what I literally I just wrote. Like after s- having seen him shot twice in the face and then burned alive completely, it kind of was shocking to see him return. However, Halloween taught us, Halloween taught two taught us that Michael is no longer human. He is a monster that cannot be stopped, and I think we really get to witness that in this movie specifically. He has one mission and one mission only, and it's murdering a little girl who is his niece. Do you remember the ending? Yeah. When he's like fucking jumps on the car and like they fucking throw him off and then the whole town fucking lights him up with their gun. Yes. Knowing that there's that's how movie, that's how five started too. Yeah. Knowing that there's more movies, just like one went into two. Mm-hmm. Is it shocking to you at all that that's how they ended this? Knowing that they have to keep him alive? Yeah. I just think the like Dude, eventually you have to fucking die. Die after being and you get under- shot a hundred times, hit by a car, and then you fall like fifty feet into a well. I don't know of like lots of like, and you're also. I guess this is a while after, because he was in a coma after Halloween two, so I, I guess I can see why he is repaired from Halloween two. He gets shot like a shit ton of times, and he falls down a fucking well, and he gets hit by a car. Is it crazy to think that like you? Just created a monster that no one can defeat. Like, what's the fucking point anymore? Or what's the point of staying in that town? Yeah, just fucking leave. But yeah. Lori already did it. She figured it out. She died. That is my question. And that th- this comes actually later in uh, Halloween 6. So we have the ending. Mm-hmm. We have Michael falling down the well. What did you think of the very end, though? 
are we at all surprised or like what do we think about Jamie stabbing her stepmother in the bath like like when that happened i was completely shocked it completely yeah, caught me by surprise cuz it didn't like didn't relate to any of her other part of her as a character correct she was literally like scared and afraid like like five minutes before that they were all like hugging each other on the couch correct and then all of a sudden she was up in the room and you just see her holding in the knife. so what does that mean well they explain it in the in number five as they move forward they kind of yeah they kind of explain that she like doesn't remember what happened and doesn't can't explain what happened to her yeah she's like almost like has this weird psychic yeah. connection with Michael where, like, he can feel her, she can feel him kind of yeah. thing. It was completely out of place from the rest of the movie. And it was shocking. It was, yeah. for sure. But I thought that it was a kick-ass ending. And then we go into, uh, I think that we get the teaser that will become what we call, like, the, st- the thorn timeline, where this, like, cult kind of thing starts to be woven in. But just because... Everyone goes to the school, mm-hmm. and they see, like, Michael has written, like, Sawin on the board, and that becomes important later, but, like, at the time, I remember watching and be like, what the fuck? Like, Michael doesn't give a shit about cults and rituals. Like, why the fuck does this matter at all? I thought that it was really out of place, and it only, like, makes sense. I should just say, Halloween 4 was one of my favorites. I really liked it. I think because the very, very end where Jamie stabs his stepmom, like, caught me completely by surprise. I don't often get caught completely by surprise in these kind of movies. It's, if not completely predictable, at least understandably predictable. And that literally, I had no idea that that was going to happen. Nothing, cause it literally, because it had nothing to fucking do with what was they, going on they, so far. And they don't explain it well in the next one. They don't. Speaking of the next one, we're talking about Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, directed by Dominique Ostenen Girard, released in 1989. We're almost to the 90s now. This picks up one year after Halloween 4. Jamie has been obviously traumatized and has been mute after her encounter with Michael. Uh, Michael returns to finish what he started, targeting Jamie and her friends as they try to uncover the dark secrets behind his relentless pursuit. Film introduces also the mysterious figure known as the Man in Black, which hints at a larger, unexplained force at play. What did you think of Halloween 5? I remember liking this one more than Halloween 4. Really? Okay. And I think it has to do with they were trying to, like, explain the mystique or the mystere of Michael Myers. Okay. Did they not? Or was that 6? No. They don't explain shit in this movie. So I'm thinking of six. I'm sorry. They explain that there's a connection. Well, they don't really explain it. They feature a lot that there's a connection between Jamie and Michael. As far as Jamie can experience what Michael's doing. And I don't know if it goes the other way, but I know that Jamie can experience Michael's yeah things. Which is why she goes into these trances and why she freaks out and stuff like that. Is because she can channel Michael pretty yeah. much. And that explains why she stabbed her foster mother. Do you think it like successfully like builds from four? I feel like it just it 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 was. I feel like there's a natural progression from four to six. I think that five doesn't do a shit ton. So five is to break things down even like a little bit more, so you know which one we're yeah we're all that's, talking that's, about. I watched when, so many of them in a row. So it's there's no babysitters anymore. Okay. Jamie's in the mental hospital yeah. with her buddy Billy. I remember this, yeah. Right? And there's Rachel and her good friend Tina, who God, Jamie just keeps asking for them to hang out with her because it's the one year anniversary when from when she was almost murdered and they're like, Fuck you, little kid, we're going to party. Mm-hmm. Then she goes back, and they're like, okay, you're right. I should probably hang out with It's just you. like, no, just stay, like, you have a, well, she like, a baby at the end. A baby child that is asking you to, like, hang out because she's terrified on Halloween. It just, like, blew my mind that they were like, I get what you're saying, but we're, like, not going to do that. We're going to go party. It's like, come on, man. Like, it's a fucking kid. Help him out. Anyways. She does, she does eventually. Yeah. 
She goes, uh, because her pa- it was don't her parents make her? Goes, yeah, oh, I guess you're right. And then she's like sincere. No, the parents aren't even there. Then who's the one that like yells at her and tells her that she needs to hang out with Janie? I feel like someone did. I don't. No, I don't. I mean, they go and party, and then they eventually like go back to like the mental asylum mm-hmm. because I think there's some somehow they're like Jamie communicates with her be like you need to get here like shit's go or like they know that things are going on i think that's why they like start to see that like people are dying and stuff like that i thought this movie was like okay i think it's worth watching but i don't recommend it as a horror man not your Uh, there's just like too much going on they already have this crazy connection between the family thing and then now jamie and michael can like communicate with each other and now they're also like, oh, yeah, they can also, like, there's this cult aspect that they're bringing into the movie. It's like, it's the same. The only issue that I really had with Halloween 3 is that there's too many fucking eggs. And there's just one basket. And it's like, dude, fucking pick something and run with it. There's no fucking, like, the plot is just too much. Yeah, there's too much shit going on here to even be able to, like, try to figure out. Going. I think Michael just becomes more and more unstoppable. He literally can't be killed in this, and we realize that. Yeah, go on. Sorry, I was, I was. It, it's not in this one. It's in the next one. We have the super unlikable character that I put as a note in this one, and okay. it's not the same thing. I think it's a fast-paced movie for the most part. Were there any scenes that like really like cracked you up or like you thought were good? Because I think we're starting to get into like laughable Halloween now. No, I think the only thing I like can vaguely remember is them getting ready to party in the house and showering. You know what? Rachel doesn't even fucking make it. She dies so early. I forgot about this whole thing. She dies in the house. Yeah, earlier, like 15 minutes into the movie. So Tina's responsible. And that's what I, and I had it written down as Tina. And then I like looked at my notes. I was like, oh, that is making sense. Rachel's the babysitter. Yeah, that's Uh, Rachel dies immediately. Tina is the one that, it is continuously being asked to hang out by Jamie, and she's like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm going to party. And it's just like, you already know your friend is missing. Why are you not hanging out with this no. child? No, there were not. A, there was nothing memorable for me in this yeah. one. I had a hard time, like, linking the difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah. I said earlier. These three movies, four, five, and six, are all... It's, there, in, there's it's some, the style of it. There's it's some all things, the same There's some style. things in six that... Obviously, stand out that we're going to talk about. So we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that I had some funny things. I think that we start to get into like what I would call traditional style exploitative these two thousands films in the barn, like party barn scenes, where like, oh yeah, there's a party and everyone's having fun, and then they separate and then they get killed, and they're because they separated to go have sex and stuff like that. Like pretty standard that yes. like gives a lot of but, like that's it's from like. I don't even think they came up with that in this. You know, that's from Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. Exactly. Sweet. Let's move on to Halloween 6. Fine. Released in 1995. Directed by Joe Chappelle. No relationship to Dave Chappelle. So 89 to 95. 95. Yeah. All right. Key plot points. This film develops deeper or dives deeper into the mythology of Michael Myers, revealing his connection to a cult known as thorn that has manipulated his actions for years jamie now a young mother attempts to escape the cult and save her baby from michael's wrath the film explores themes of fate and the cycle of violence as characters attempt to confront their anyways what do you think of halloween the curse of michael myers you laughed but i loved it how do you love this movie Hal rod i get it second of all they replace the spooky Michael Myers theme for dumping me- 90s metal music for the background. So everywhere there was like Michael was about to chase someone, it was like, do 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 I have notes on it. Instead of that, you know, the, when Paul Rudd has this baby and it's holding on to the baby. Every- He's just holding it someone else's baby for the entire movie. The whole movie. That's, you know, and those are selfish reasons for liking the movie, but like mostly I like the thumping 90s metal. I thought that the 90s metal was the worst part of it. I literally have a note written like the noodling guitar 
was like, mm-hmm. like, no, just, just do the Halloween music. If you want to do the fucking noodly, fucking noodly distorted guitar, just fucking make a new movie. It just like, I literally, I have written underneath that. I'm about to turn this thing off. Well, so here's the deal. You're pissed off about the noodling 90s metal guitar because it's not the same as the other Michael Myers movies. Mm -hmm. Correct? And you should say, just make another movie. However, you celebrate Halloween 3 has no fucking anything to do with Michael Myers. The music is just as fucking over the top. For sure. Yeah. So, But it's a different story. This is the same story. You want to read? Right. Yes, go on. I think this movie was fucking awful. I was lost for like almost the entire movie. I had no idea what was actually happening. I was definitely lost. Even at the end, they don't even clear up the questions about the cult, really. And it was either a combination of bad writing or bad acting that all the characters are they don't know how to speak even paul rudd's character is a fucking and i get it paul rudd's character is supposed to be a weirdo we bring back tommy who is i did appreciate the cameo being brought back laurie's the the kid that laurie is babysitting is tommy in the beginning no no so from halloween one Mm -hmm. tommy paul rudd's character is who Lori was babysitting. Oh, I don't know. What, you thought Paul Rudd was just randomly in this? I don't, I guess I missed that. Yeah, no, he was there. That's why he's so invested. Was this That's why he one? has all this shit posted up on the walls and stuff like that. Uh, no, is this also the one with George, or Gordon Lovitz in it too? Yeah, he's at the very is beginning the- when he gets the hockey skate through his fucking head. Yeah, that was pretty sweet. I have a note about that. It was pretty yeah. bad. Uh, no, actually... That was our next movie. Okay, sorry, go on. Sorry, because I do have notes about that. That was sweet. I thought that like this movie was just really bad. I thought that it was bad acting. I thought that it was bad writing. I was so lost. I had no idea what was happening. They spent about 30 seconds of the opening to the movie zooming in on a baby's dick. They introduced an awful character in John Strode, who is Jamie's uncle, I guess it would be. I don't know. But he's a fucking awful human, and I believe that Ronnie, who was later brought up in Rob Zombie's movie, is literally brought... He was like, that's a really shitty guy. I should make a character like that in my movie. I think that it leaned in way too heavily into this occult theme that, like, never got resolved. And, like, they can't get out of it because they've already dug their way way into it. And they didn't have anything fun to try to, like, make it a ridiculous, funny movie. Mm Mm-hmm. So they just kept digging harder into ridiculous cult aspects of it. The noodling with the guitar was fucking so upsetting to me. (laughs) And then there's the fact that this is obviously a made-for-TV movie because you have, like, the black, like, the fade-to-black scenes with no commercial coming, and then it just pops back up again. So is the the next one, though, too. So funny. The next one completely cracked me up. The next one was the same way, too. I just thought maybe that's how they did horror movies in the 90s. <laughs> they're forgot, all, like, they're they're all, all going like, to be on TV. fucking FX event or whatever. Dude, it was just like, TV that, was TV the, that was the big like rerun area. So yeah. they all made these movies just like with spots for commercial breaks. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, like, Seven is the same way. And I literally, I actually did have like a little like nostalgic feeling about like, man, like I do remember turning on the TV around this time of year and being like, Dude, what fucking horror movie do I want to tune into right now? Curling up on the couch, like, getting some popcorn and just, like, sitting down and thumbing through channels, deciding which horror movie I wanted to watch. And I did have a little bit of nostalgia, and this did kind of bring that because it has those, like, really awful breaks. And I just feel like we don't have that same feeling anymore, no. let alone going to theaters. I went to the theater two days ago. Good for you, dude. Honk, honk. I don't have a whole lot more that I really... I feel like we're wasting our time on this. We are. All right, we're going to Halloween H2O, a.k.a. 20 Years Later. Released in 1988, directed by Steve Miner. 88? 98. 98. Did I say 88? Yep. Sorry. 20 Years Later, 1998. Set 20 years after the original Halloween, Laurie Strode is living under an assumed name as a prep school principal with her own son. 
She's not dead. She's trying to escape her past, but Michael discovers her location and returns to finish what he started. Lori's son starts out as the primary subject of Michael's attack. The film focuses on Lori's struggles with her trauma and her efforts to protect her son from Michael. The climactic confrontation leads to a shocking twist with Lori finally taking a stand against Michael by kidnapping his body and cutting off his fucking head. Fucking boom on it. Kick ass movie. Great. What are your thoughts? I fucking loved every second of it. Right? I, it made me like mad at four, five, and six. I literally was like, wait, how? Because I, like I mentioned, like I have not gone through and done all this before. Now I have to go back through and re under I have to see what the timelines are. And I thought that it was so refreshing to have something that didn't involve a fucking cult, that didn't involve uh, weird psychic connections. I just love this movie because it was a true follow-up to Halloween 2. Well, they just... To the events of Halloween 1 and 2. Yeah, so in this movie's mind, 3, 4, 5, and 6 didn't exist. Which is interesting. Yes. Yeah. I thought this movie was kick-ass. I thought that the storyline, maybe, was a little flat. But no offense to the Halloween genre... Uh, that's kind of the name of the no, game. They don't no, have a no, lot different. of storyline. It's just like, oh, Michael's here to kill you. Good luck. It was it was the introduction of uh, Josh Hartnett. Yep. Would you think of like the Frankenstein allegory here? Do you remember that? No. When they're in class, um, there's like a whole thing where like they're talking about how Frankenstein, like Doctor Frankenstein, needs to actually confront his monster to defeat him, kind of thing. And that's obviously what happens in this movie. Yes. And they leaned really, really hard into it. I didn't pick up on that at all. No. I guess I'm not a, I wasn't paying that good of attention as you were. I was looking more for that. I was going through and taking lots of notes. So yeah, was, these are things that like I saw and I was like, damn, dude, like they're really leaning hard into this Frankenstein allegory where like Michael Myers is obviously Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Lori didn't create this shit. No. I do miss Dr. Loomis. He's, like, one of my favorites, so it was a bummer to not see him in these movies. Um, or from here on out, pretty much. That's how he, that's how he comes back. And was that just... You know, they may do flashbacks, but he yeah. he died between yeah. five and... Or between six and H2O. We're obviously in a modern setting. Yeah. Even for... It's surprising that this movie only came out five or three years after Halloween 6. But it just feels so much more modern. Six felt like it was still made in the 80s. No. H2O felt like it was made in the 2000s. I thought that the Paul Rudd was that that was 6, right? Mm -hmm. I thought that was like early 90s. It felt And it was it was really very early 90s yes. where H2O felt like it was really dipping into the modern era. Yes, it was yeah. more of a 2000s style movie featured LL Cool J. Yep. Yep, he's a security guard at the mm -hmm. gate. It's also the first time, I think, and I could be wrong, you can... Quite a few people live in this one. Michelle Williams? She was her, one of her first movies. She was an actress. Lori lives. Does I'm pretty sure Lori's boyfriend lives. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure her son lives. And her son's friend or the girlfriend. I can't remember which one is. That's a lot. Yes. For Michael. Yeah. There's usually one... Or two people that survive, like that are that are main characters. And now I know what you're talking. Yeah, I think this one was also so good because we get to see Lori as, like I kind of mentioned at the beginning. What do we think of Lori's character arc? Well, there's not a fucking lot to see. Exactly. We get to see it now. We get to see what 20 years does to someone living in a state of paranoia, PTSD, trauma, all of that, and. Oh alcoholism yes for, all of that yep i mean we get to see that come back also um in the final trilogy but i think that and it gets way more intense i think in the final trilogy this one was like a brush where like maybe Lori's a little paranoid but she seems to like live her life normally mm -hmm. for the most I part she's it. not a fucking like, survivalist out yeah. in the middle of fucking nowhere just waiting for michael to show up yeah um she's definitely worried that he'll show up yeah i think also, what I was going to mention, we're talking about like when these movies were made and stuff like that. What I think you experience with the Halloween movies more than lots of other film franchises is their settlement in like, time and the culture of specifically America. You can like feel a vibe 
from these movies about when this movie was made. Exactly. Which is really, really cool. And I think that you don't get to see that in a lot of horror franchises. You know, like, oh, yeah, it's fucking prep school, late 90s, Mm -hmm. early 2000s. This is like when this takes place. You know, you can tell 78. Like, this feels like a movie that was made in 70. Yes. It's it's just, and I thought that that was, it's not really anything that needs to go any further than that. I just thought it was really cool, and I think it makes this franchise specifically very unique. Anything else? No, I thought that this was, I didn't know how they were going to be able to get the ending off. Right. How do you keep going? This is, this is it. This is awesome. I love that Laurie Strode was back. Yeah, she fucking takes her final stand. She fucking kidnaps his body. Yes. From the police. And then just like straight up fucking crashes the car and straight cuts his fucking head off. Yes. I thought this this was a breath of fresh air after watching the last three. Cut to yeah. Halloween Resurrection released in 2002. The height of really bad MTV shows. Yep. Uh, the... Events of H2O, or this is following directly following the events of H2O. Lori has been institutionalized after killing what she believed was Michael, but he soon returns to Haddonfield once again, targeting her and her friends. We learn that he switched suits mm-hmm. with one of the police officers it in the, H2O. Ambulance. It was the EMT. Okay, was it the EMT? Okay. Yeah. And then snuck away, pretty much. Yeah. Lori cut off the head of the T- EMT worker. Yep. Um, the plot centers around a group of college students who participate in a reality show in the Myers household, unaware of danger that lurks within. Can I also say that I thought... Let's just talk about this that, movie. Can I... So, that was a very clever way to explain why... They can continue why, to why Michael, Michael Myers. Myers. Yes. Yes. Out of, like, a lot of the other ones, they didn't explain it. Yep. It was just, like, was fucking on fire, and then he wasn't on fire anymore. Yep. This one was like, oh yeah, he likes he was like conniving and switchy, and I was like, all right, that that's clever. Yeah, but that's not him. Nope, he's not tricky. No, nope. in fact, tricks are the only thing that seem to work against him. Yes, we have in the original Thorn series, um, Doctor Loomis does beat the absolute fuck out of him at the end of five. I think it is. Yeah, because then he's in the prison, and then the prison blows up by dropping a net onto him because he lures him with Jamie. Oh yeah, but anyways, tricking Michael. And that happens at the beginning of this movie. Lori tricks Michael again and leads him up to the roof because she knows she fucked up last time. She has to fucking check. And that fucking leads to her death demise, apparently. Which I fucking hated. I just, I, I never know when anyone's alive and dead in these, so I don't presume. Yeah, well, yeah. Like, there could be in Resurrection 2. In five years, the fuck or better. whatever, better not be. Um, yeah, where it's all gonna be on TikTok. But anyways, the main ju- like the, the the crux of this whole story is that like there's a online reality show where a bunch of college kids go into the Myers household and they try to investigate why Michael Myers did what he did, and uh, he fucking kills a few of them, but not all of them. Damn weird. Just like in the last movie, he. Seems to let a couple live. I was just Buster Rhymes and uh, the main girl. Yeah. Random. Yeah. Right? Is she, is she random? Yeah. She has okay. nothing to do other than she's like kind of a love interest of this other kid that's at a party. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think the, the main notes I had is like, Michael's not a trickster. It pisses me off that they ran with that. And then I just didn't know why he went there. Like, I guess I like he has to go back to the house. Is that, like, his thing? Every Halloween? Maybe. But, like, Lori's dead. What What the fuck else does he have to do? They they don't explain any of that. Yeah, they don't. They just completely skip over it. Well, like, I have some questions to ask here. This movie was, for the most part, fucking awful. Yeah. I don't feel like we should spend a whole lot of time on it. No. I did want to say that there's a lot of, like, early 2000s American Pie kind of humor it is it. a lot of it's like raunchy like i'm kind of a sweet guy but i'm gonna say some really fucking inappropriate shit yes like oh those are some nice legs when do they open yeah she's like fuck you he's like oh what a clock and she's like <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that because i think that we should skip 
immediately into our next movie, which has just as awful of dialogue because it's Rob Zombie's Halloween 2007. Now, I only say that because I fucking love this movie. I love it too. But I don't think that Rob Zombie is very good at writing dialogue. Because I think he tries way, way too hard to do those edgier things like we're talking about. And it just is almost awkward at points. Did he write this? I mean, I'm sure that... I think. I mean, I guess maybe he just... Wrote, no, dude. But whoever is Rob Zombie's, like, writing partner obviously has a hand in this. Because it's not just this movie. It's every Rob Zombie movie. Mm -hmm. They always have, like, the most awkward, the weirdest fucking phrases that, like, they're trying so hard to be edgy and cool they're kind of fucking like okay that's an interesting like choice of words you use there let's go really really corny i would say it's corny yes it is of this one all right um rob zombies remake presents a more in-depth exploration of michael myers backstory focuses on traumatic events bring of his upbringing and the events that led to his escape it's not quite a scene-by-scene remake of the original but it emphasizes the impact of the abuse on his own psyche, portraying Michael's complex character and adding depth to his motivations. There's a little twist to the original Halloween, but for the most part, it's the same story, mm-hmm. I think. It has that white trash in it. The white trashy right? It's the Rob Zombie white trash, man. Like, yeah. Not quite as much as I think the second one does. Shut the fuck up, bitch. Yeah, I'm listening to me. <laughs> yeah, Ronnie, dude. That thing's a fucking piece going, of shit. You're going to strip. Yes. Mm-hmm. With that said, I did really enjoy this movie, though. This one yes. is very close to my favorite. Only because I think that... I don't know. What, what, what did you like about it, I guess, before, we, before I jump in? I kind of like the backstory. Mm-hmm. I liked that he talked. Yep. I liked that it showed like the the whole relationship between him and Loomis. Yep. And then I liked that it went twenty years later and it showed Danny Trujillo yeah. being like really nice and like he's understood yeah. misunderstood. And then Mike Miles still fucking yeah. kills him. Doesn't give a shit. I like that Michael Myers was like fucking six foot ten. Yeah, and they made a note of it. They're like, "Oh, this is fucking." There's a big boy. This is a huge motherfucker. Yeah, and he was just like dumb jock, like fucking swing and just beat the or murder the fuck out of people with like two swings. Mm-hmm. You got anything else for why you liked it? Um, I liked the music play- placement in this one. He's very he's Rob music Zombie, person, dude. Yes, he's so good. And I'll get into the fact that I didn't like the music placement in the second. Sure. Love it because I agree. Yeah. As far as the first one, I just, like, fucking love Rob Zombie movies mm-hmm. so much. He did, I think, in my opinion, like, an incredible job re-envisioning this, like, reimagining this movie. You can tell that, like, it's not just a movie that he's making. This is obviously, in my opinion, how I'm looking at it. Like, it's a passion project. Michael Myers and the Halloween series have obviously, like had a huge impact on him. Yes. Specifically Michael Myers, because I think while the first ones were a lot about Lori, this is Michael Myers' story. Uh-huh. And yes, we get, and we'll, we'll, I'll get to a question later about Lori and this, but it's just, it's such a good take in a modern sense on Halloween. Yes. From so, someone like Rob Zombie. So I did watch an interview with Rob Zombie about the, these movies mm-hmm. and kind of explains why the first one was so good and then the second one was so bad. Yeah. I'm sure, did you watch the same thing? Uh-uh. So he just talks about how... Zombie? Yeah. yeah. Rob Zombie talks about how hard it was to work with Bob and Harvey Weinstein in this Really? Like, he talks about how Bob Weinstein would just, like, scre- like screamed at him, talking about how this was the worst fucking NC he's ever seen, just like, this is fucking garbage, I can't believe you'd fucking write or, like, direct this movie, it's never gonna work out, just, like, completely shitting on Rob Zombie, to the point where Rob Zombie's like, I never want to work with these fucking dudes again, like, yeah. fuck this corporate world, mm-hmm. and then blows the fuck up. 
Yeah. Like box office wise. And he like he quotes about talking about how Bob Weinstein goes and completely retorts the, exactly the thing he says. It's like this is the fucking most brilliant movie that's ever been written. We're gonna make twenty of these. Yeah. And so he quit. Right. And that's why they didn't make more. He quit before two. And there was two other directors that they tried to make the second one. Uh-huh. And the, either they they either quit or got fired. Yeah. And finally they reached and went back to Rob Zombie and were like, hey, we need you like to direct the second movie. Interesting. And he goes, I will direct the second movie on one condition. I don't have, you get me out of my contract where I have to make a trilogy. Yeah. She's like, this is the last. I'll make one. I'll make I'm not more, making two. And that's it. And I kind of think what, that's why this one, or Halloween 2, is what we'll, we'll talk about how it was completely awful compared yeah. to the first one. Yeah. I thought that, I, I have like my own thoughts on Halloween 2. It's obviously not as good as this first one. I wanted to just, I thought that this movie was so phenomenal because we get Michael in the most, I don't want to necessarily say human, but we get emotions in this film that are just so visceral. And it is, we get, in the early movies, Dr. Loomis talks about, like, he's just evil and he's governed only by rage. But we don't see that, right? We see in the early movies, like in the original series, I think that we see Michael not necessarily like robotic, but he's very like straightforward of just like, I'm just killing and I'm on a mission to get to a place. Mm -hmm. Whereas like the Rob Zombie films, more than any of the other films in the entire series, have an emotional feeling to Michael. Specifically, and like, and only... Because we don't really get to experience Michael otherwise in his killings, man. It is brutal. It is personal. It yeah. is heartfelt. You can feel the emotion in how this is done. And I have to give Rob Zombie all of the fucking credit because he makes Michael Myers an emotional human. Not a robot that is just going around killing, mm -hmm. but a human that is governed by emotions and Dude, it is so fucking good. Like, I love this movie, despite the weird little dialogue quirks. We get this, and we teased it earlier. We see the mask becoming an important part in the very first kill that Michael has. Yes. With the bully in the park. Huh? And he literally has to put on the mask before he can do this. Do we think this is like a compartmentalization for Michael to where he can't do the evil that he has to do? without putting the mask on or is he shielding himself from something what is the mask doing for him well he kind of explained that to his mom after in the he, second after no in the first one after he was oh he just for he doesn't remember any of it or is it the it, it's in one of them he explains that he let he where she's like she tries to take have him take his yes yeah, off takes so like, take the mask off he's like no I hate the way I feel and look without it. Correct. So but I think that it's deeper than that. I think that he has some severe, obviously, trauma. And this yeah. movie obviously provides him all the reason. Like, Dr. Loomis specifically says, like, it's the perfect, whatever you he says, like, the perfect combination of nature and nurture. Where, like, he's abused by his family, by his sister, by his dad or stepdad, I guess, and he's, and these bullies, as well as he's already psychologically disturbed. So, and it, I thought that it was really interesting also that they brought in Dr. Loomis before the murders. Yeah. That was a, a cool little twist. I will say that I 100% fucking hate Malcolm Adele's face, and I, he just deserves to be punched every time he's in public. I'm sorry, please don't punch Malcolm Adele when he's in public, but like, his face is a punchable face. What a, For what Rob Zombie made him to be, such a good casting decision. But I liked Dr. Loomis in the original series, and I fucking hated him well, they in made, the Rob Zombie series. They shoot. made it pretty 
well known to hate him. Like, especially- no, 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 for sure. That's what I'm saying. It was a good casting decision yeah. by him because he has a shitty fucking face that you want to punch. Yes. Yeah. What do we think of Lori? What like so? Scout Taylor Compton is the girl that plays Lori. What do we think of her? Is she just a ripoff of Sherry Moon Zombie? <laughs> I didn't think about it until then, but yeah, probably. And that's 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 what I was like, dude. Especially going into the second one, first where she gets she's really gonna, annoying. I think she's completely a different character in the first compared to the second one. Yeah, like even like in the original, like Lori Strode was like. It's like changed a little bit, but mm-hmm. in from the first to the second, Rob Zombies, she's like over the top innocent in the first one, and then over the top like a Rob Zombie esque character. She's just like another like yeah. Rob Zombie character in the second. One. I work in a comic book store, and I love yeah. rock and roll. Well, that's and it's interesting that you bring up you brought up that Rob Zombie gets to pretty much have his own license to do whatever he wants with the second movie. Mm-hmm. And it's not at all surprising that it is so much more of a Rob Zombie movie versus a Rob Zombie adaption. Mm-hmm. All right. So, yeah, released just a year later. Was it? Two years later. Two years later, 2009, we have Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Uh, the sequel picks up immediately after the events of the first remake showing the aftermath of Michael Myers' rampage and Laurie's psychological struggles. However, Laurie now grappling with trauma, we cut to a year later, experiences hallucinations of her deceased mother, which adds a surreal layer to this narrative. Well, I feel like you're one of the big things that I kind of liked about the first one, or the second one, that we almost skipped was it kind of seemed like it was going to be very similar to Halloween 2, the original Halloween 2. Like, they showed her, like, in the the hospital and her fighting for her life. Yep. And everything. Yep. Like, the whole it looked movie. like it was going to be just like the, like, yeah. And the first one, and we didn't really discuss it, but, like, there were some scenes that were, like, almost shot for shot. Exactly. And some that were a little twist. Didn't venture outside the realm. Unless they were, like, explaining a backstory. But they didn't do a different story. Yes. They just explained maybe something that was happening. Huh. Whereas this one pretends to be something until it changes yeah. completely. Exactly. So I, I felt like you were about to jump off away from that. But, yeah, they literally, like, shot for shot, or they made it seem like it was going to be just, like, the second. Or going to going to, you're in the hospital. Lori's fighting for her life. We see Michael brutally, I think that the emotion gets even more turned up in this movie. Stab a, one of the orderlies. Yeah. I thought to myself, I'm like, how can we, how is this movie going to be two hours? If they're, like, is she just going to be fucking, he's already there. <laughs> she, she, you know what I mean? She's chasing her, so, like, she's going to be chasing, running a circle, chasing her. For two hours. For two hours? We're 15 like, minutes into this movie and the orderly is already crazy. dead. Yeah. How is this going to keep going? And yeah. then, yeah, she what? Wakes up. Yep. And it was all a nightmare. Yep. No, I, like, and that's, you know, gets to, like, my first question is, like, what did we think of Rob Zombie's move, like, that that move specifically, where he, like, teased his audience by saying, hey, just like I did the first one, we're going to do the second one. And then completely turn it on its head. It's a year later, not hours later. Right. And we have a whole different story that Rob Zombie has created that is, you know, it's, it's a new storyline. Mm-hmm. It's not the same. He's not making Halloween 2, 2. You yeah. know what I mean? He's making his own version of Correct. Halloween 2. Of what? Um, what'd you think of that? Like, is that, did you, do you wish that he had made Halloween 2? Ro- like Rob Zombie's Halloween 2? No, I thought it was a really clever way. Of getting out of that situation. Correct. Where I was like, this is fucking stressful. How do how do we keep going with this? And then that's where it was like, it went straight to over the top Rob Zombie for me. She's like got dreads. Yeah, she's she's in her, what do you want to call it? Like her her alternative phase. Yeah. Hey, can we pause real quick? Yeah, dude. Go for it. It'll let me regroup real quick. We're back. 
I think we were talking about we we're talking about Halloween two, and that's it. I'm sorry, I had to pee really <laughs> bad, so I had to stop us. You're good, dude. I'd rather have you pee in the toilet than pee in your pants. I don't have pants on. I just have a towel on. That's fair. You should have just gone. All right. Where are we at? I was just going to say, so I think we were talking about how we liked that Rob Zombie was able to do the first Halloween as like a remake. The second one is not a remake. It's a, it's, it's a redo of the story. And I thought that it was really cool. Because I think that you get to see Rob Zombie be Rob Zombie and not just like giving his own take on something. Yes. So what I did like was that it was, yeah, she's alternative and obviously there's like a sweet record store that's super cool and the dialogue just gets even more Rob Zombie-esque where everyone's like cocksucker and like, hey, little bitch and just dumb shit that like Rob Zombie thinks is cool, but it's like kind of cheesy. But I well, forgive him for all of those little things. Also, like the overplay of the song "Nights in White Satin." Uh, lots of that. Yeah, like "Cause I Love You." Well, it's like literally on every TV. Like, why would everyone just be watching that movie? That was clearly you know why? Why? Uh, because she is dreaming, and it's on the TV in her room when she's having that dream. Of all of them. It was also on the TV in the the security guard in the hotel. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, she's dreaming. The yep. whole hospital thing is all while she's dreaming, and then she wakes up, and that's what's on the TV. Mm-hmm. That would explain that. Uh, Didn't mean to burst that bubble. I liked it. Either Thank way. You. Thank yeah. you. Um, you are a cinephile. I don't know about that, but I mm-hmm. took a lot of notes, because I was like trying to pay attention so I could get you good questions and stuff like that, and whatever. Anyways, I thought that this movie was not as good. As the first one, I think we already discussed that. Mm-hmm. I think that Lori becomes really fucking annoying in this one. Yep. Especially when she starts to lose a little bit or when she gets a little drunk and she just starts fucking screaming. It's fucking annoying as shit. Mm-hmm. I like don't know exactly what the reason for that is other than Rob Zombie doesn't really care about Lori. He cares about Michael and telling Michael's story. Also, is that I'm, correct? Yes. Sorry, I... I'm going to butt in about, I was upset about that her throwing a fit about not wanting to go to the Halloween party. And then the like, last minute, she's like, yeah, you're right. Let's go. And yeah. then they all fucking nail characters from Rocky Horror Picture Show. I'm dressed up as a guy. I'm dressed as a girl, dressed up as a guy, dressed up as a girl. They say it like 20 times. That's yeah, the only reason like, why. Fucking, like, it was like, oh, it'd be like probably... Some of the coolest, it's like little, Rocky. like on point yeah. for like some high schoolers that are putting some shit together. Yeah, or just, or I guess they're maybe, in college now. But like, what? maybe I would want to go on it. Yes. Yeah. So I go, what was your question? I didn't have another question. I just thought that um, I didn't love this movie as much as I loved the first one, but I did mm-hmm. think that there were some very interesting takes that Rob Zombie did with this movie. Most notably, you have your like typical hero's journey in classic literature where. You know, you have the hero leaving and then he faces, you know, these trials that he has to go through on the way to his final journey and like to his home. And he gets back home at the end of it. And I thought that it was a really cool inversion that they did with that story being Michael Myers story in this where it's not a protagonist. It is the antagonist. He's there to kill everyone. But they have this very very stereotypical hero's journey taking place for him and i thought that that was really cool because i've read and seen lots of movies where obviously your protagonist and the good guy is the person that is on the journey to get to a place that he has to he needs to get home eventually and i thought that it was really cool that they did that for michael myers it obviously shows that rob zombies his preference and his care and who he's wanting to portray and define in these stories is not the characters outside of Michael Myers. It is Michael Myers himself, which we don't get from almost any of the other movies. No, not at all. So I thought that was really cool. Let's see. What's up with the White Horse and Deborah Myers? I hate it. Right? Why? Why? Just because that's his mom. 
and that horse are just talking to him, trying to convince him to come back and do the right thing by killing Laurie Stroud. That's why they're all together again at the end. Right, but it's it's the same thing with the cult. Like, I just, I don't get why it's there. There's no reason they, to. He has the quote at the beginning where it's like, White Horse, which is the reason for why people act, but they act in ways of anger and chaos. And I can 100% attribute Rob Zombie's Halloweens are the epitome of anger and chaos, mm -hmm. for sure. But I just didn't get, I don't know why it was there. It, like, it didn't make any sense to me. Is he hallucinating these things? Is she hallucinating these things? Is this PTSD manifesting? I think that's one of the biggest things that bother me about this movie. For sure. No question. It's, it's, like, it's the biggest thing. I wouldn't say it's the biggest thing. Scout Taylor Compton's, like, super obnoxious, yelling, drunk voice mm -hmm. bothered me a lot. But the weird horse and Sherry Moon zombie just, like, hanging out and trying to tell everyone what to fucking do didn't make any fucking sense to me. And I was just making sure that it wasn't just me and that I didn't just miss something. Why do I not like this? Why does it not make any sense? No, it was dumb. I thought so, too. Is she, we, so we have Lori at the very end in the hospital. Is it kind of the similar thing with like Jamie where like she sins of the father, the sins of the mother, whatever have been passed down to the child kind of thing where she is going to be all fucked up and she's going to try to kill people. She already has the fucking creepy ass look on her face. Like she's going to do it, but you don't really get a whole lot after that. You no, know, I thought the, all was like the barn. Mm -mm. At the end, mm. the end of the movie, mm. was all in the barn, mm. where she was like, thought she was getting held down by... Yeah, that, that, that all happened. Yeah. Yeah. But a fucking sniper, like, rips Michael in the fucking face, mm -hmm. and he falls, like, into, like, exposed rebar, I think, mm -hmm. and, like, stabs through him, like, multiple times, and then she fucking stabs the fuck out of him, and then she walks out of the barn, wearing the mask, mm -hmm. and then takes it off. The movie ends with her and like, what was that movie with J-Lo where she's the psychiatrist? Giggly. And what? Gigli. Gigli? Gigli? Yeah. M made in Manhattan. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not going to have the answer to this. Oh, I know. But anyways. I don't know a lot of J-Lo movies. It's this psychological thriller movie where J-Lo is interviewing serial killer and they're trying to find where like his last bodies are or maybe even like he has like a couple people that are like about to die i can't remember but it's this big long room that Lori is in at the end walking down the room is deborah myers and this fucking white horse yeah and it just like fucking i was like what the fuck man like is this the same like is he just stealing from fucking halloween 4 where like Michael and Lori have, or Michael and Jamie at that point, but Michael and Lori in this certain section, they have this weird psychological connection. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I literally, I lost interest in this movie oh. like halfway through. I didn't hate this movie. I just did not think it was as good as the first yes. one. All right. We're moving right into the next one. Halloween 2018, directed by David Gordon Green. Obviously, released in 2018. So this one is a direct se sequel to Halloween 1 and 2 not from 1978. Not two. Well, not two? Yeah, it has nothing. Like, they explain that he only killed five people. So they, this is like if two didn't exist. So oh. it went to one to this one. Do they show that? No, they explain that he only killed five Yeah, okay. People. I guess that would make sense. I remember them saying that, but I just like thought that they didn't like account for like the rest of the people or something. No, yeah, this is it. So it's as if Michael died when he fell out the porch and then was never found? No. I was not, assuming not never that... found. He fell off the porch and then oh, and then it was arrested. And they yeah, yeah, put okay. him into a mental hospital. But that's not what happened in the first one. He's gone in the first one. That's a dumb tie in. I changed my imp entire opinion on this movie. No, you don't. I do. You don't. Go on. Lori Strode, she's like a survivalist type chick now. She has spent her entire life preparing for Michael's inevitable return. And after he escapes during a 
transport from one facility to another. He visits Haddonfield, where Lori apparently still lives. And if she was so fucking worried about Michael Myers coming back to get her, maybe she would have found somewhere different. But we kind of figure out that Lori is not so worried about Michael Myers coming back. She's been planning for this her whole goddamn life Mm -hmm. and has been raising her child and not so much a granddaughter, but definitely her child was raised to kill Michael Myers. Yeah. Which I thought was an interesting little take. In Halloween H2O, we get to experience a character that has been riddled and saddled with guilt as well, like survivor's guilt, as well as trauma, PTSD, anxiety, and of course, paranoia for 40 years now we're talking. Mm-hmm. I thought it was interesting. I'm, I'm honestly like a little bit more upset knowing that it didn't continue after Halloween 2, but it doesn't really matter. No, um, the tie-in isn't super great. I mean, it's not like pinpoint. Yeah. But I like, I definitely liked this tie-in better than all the other ones. Yeah. Okay. See, like, I just, like, I'm still, like, now having trouble wrapping my brain around the fact that, like, Michael Myers wasn't in the asylum. Like, he was never captured at the end of the first one. We're just supposed to assume that he was? Mm Mm-hmm. They don't like that, because... Was he captured in the second one? Yeah. He was caught on fire. No, for sure, but, like, they take him. They get him, and they... Well, maybe... Like, it's it's why, like, at the start of the fourth one, he's, like, in a coma, and then he wakes up. I'm pretty sure... I think you're right, though. I'm pretty sure it's the first one. Yeah. That it ties into. Okay. This movie was also, like, super weird. I don't know why I thought it was so weird. But I think it was because, like, the way that I didn't know if it was, like, an R or an X or, like, an unrated or, like, a PG-13 movie. I feel like it couldn't quite make its mind up on, like, what it wanted to be from a rating standpoint. Because you have, like, I mean, and maybe it's, like, it maybe it's more realistic than we give it credit for. Like, some of the kids are, like, they won't swear, so they say shit like, oh, fucking... I can't remember, like, instead of saying shit, he says something, like, ridiculous, silly. And, like, some of the kills are, like, you don't see anything happen. But then, ten minutes later, you have a kill that's super gruesome. And it's, like, just, like, a lot of kills. There are lots of kills. Any scenes or, like, anything that jumped out of you that you thought was particularly good about this movie? I loved this movie. Did you? Yes, I thought it was phenomenal. I thought it was good. I did not love it, but I thought it was good. No, I thought... I remember, I guess not a scene that I remember directly, but I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, fuck, this is one of my favorites, so. Okay. I like that they tricked him. I always like when Michael Myers gets tricked. When he gets stuck in the basement and they fucking light the whole thing on fire. Mm-hmm. Thought it was badass. I think my favorite scene, and it's like a, from a cinematography standpoint, it doesn't matter, like, it doesn't really change anything, but. There's a scene where Michael Myers is walking down the sidewalk and he sees this couple getting into their car and it like balances back and forth. And this is only like, I guess it could have been done back in like the 78s and in the 80s and stuff like that. We're back bouncing back and forth between like seeing Michael and then also transitioning into his point of view. And then we turn and then he goes up to this house and we are following him in his point of view. And then it actually goes like right next to him to where his reflection is showing in the window while this lady's in her house. And then the camera sticks there, and we see Michael's face in the reflection, and then he disappears from that reflection. But then we see him walking around the side of the house. We see this lady kind of in and out of this living room. And then she comes back in, and she's like, I I don't know if it's like a piano or what exactly she's doing, but we see Michael Myers come in from the back of the house through this big, long room, Mm -hmm. right? There's like, it's the main room that, the camera is focused on there's a back room that's also it's it's not a doorway that it goes through it's like a big wide doorway i guess i would too yeah i think it's from the outside to the inside exactly but it's like it's like a double door that he comes in the back door Mm -hmm. into like the kitchen area and then he comes into the living dining room area Mm -hmm. and then kills this chick and i just thought it was really cool to leave the camera yeah exactly to leave the camera focused on the exact same spot for like 30 seconds Mm -hmm. and have all of these things go on 
to come right back right into your face again. I thought that was the best shot I've seen in any of the Halloween movies. Yeah, the single. I thought it was super cool. Do you know who else uh, wrote this movie? I do not. Danny McBride. Really? Yeah, so the, the director and the writer that you spoke of before, yeah. David Gordon Green, is that his name? Yep. He and Dan McBride wrote, like, the first foot. All of these. Yeah, the first foot. Foot this way, as well as this way. Okay, spouting down. Yeah, and that the, they're they're kind of like Will Ferrell and okay, yeah, or like John C. Riley, that whole crew, and Seth Rogen and Evan Falker. Yeah, where they're just like a duo. Evan Falker isn't that the dude from Turnpike? No, but Danny McBride also wrote all three of these movies okay i did not know that that's i just remember that scene like specifically and like there was a lot of cool stuff that was done in this movie i didn't get a whole lot of like attachment to any of the characters i thought that there was the one part where uh is it judy greer Mm -hmm. is the daughter of Lori, where she's like i can't do it i can't do it and then she's like fuck you Uh, and i thought that was really cool i also thought it was like what i i had no sympathy for her when she's like, I got my mom. Well, because she's talked so much shit on her mom. My mom taught me. She only taught. She taught me how to shoot guns. Mm-hmm. And she taught me how to fight. Like, where's the? What, and what are you? What was the bad about? part? Your mom taught you how to fucking be a badass. Yeah. Yes, your mom's crazy and hid to herself, but like that's not what you said. You're like, oh, I hate that she taught me how to shoot guns so well. Uh, <laughs> taught me how to fucking beat up anyone. She. You like, didn't say she was crazy. You said that she was like. She spent her time teaching the wrong thing. Yeah. Which, at the end of the day, she's fun, right? Mm. Good work, Lori. Again. Lori, like, I think, like we talked about with the continuation of the H2O series, just like in this one, we get to see Lori develop as a character. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's it's good to see, like, she's just so strong. Yes. It's it, probably, like, one of the strongest, like, Scream Queens through franchise especially specifically through franchise history but like in slashers in general the strongest character probably in slasher genre is laurie stroud regardless of who's playing her yes it's uh, mostly her other than yeah no one else plays her that's just the rob zombie movies yeah it's that little girl that plays her in the rob zombie movies yeah sherry moon too yeah exactly yep (laughs) no i thought that like i think we we covered that one I liked it. I didn't love it. I think you liked it more than I did, it sounds like. 100%. Um, I think it did a pretty good job paying homage to the original series. It had some cool things that it did that were really subtle that only people like you and I that are now going back through this are going to pay attention to, where Lori refers to Michael Myers as the shape, yeah. which he is credited as in the first Halloween. That's He's not... Two. Yeah, in the first two Halloween movies... Michael Myers is not a character. The shape is a character that is in the final credits. So I thought that was really cool. And he also was like, and then the one I was talking about is with the sheriff where he's talking about like, oh, you know, the the babysitter murders, which was Mm -hmm. may or may not. It's apparently been debunked, but I'm also going to call bullshit. Knowing that this was maybe first meant to be an anthology series. The first movie was meant to be called the babysitter murders. Instead of Halloween or Halloween, the babysitter murders, tying back into these like kind of yeah, they, they call them these wiki, like, remember, wiki deep dives that the they're like bringing murders. back up. Yeah, yep. I think we move right from there into Halloween Kills because just like in the original series, this trilogy Does runs mean. concurrently, immediately following the events of for whatever reason Halloween. 2018. I don't know why they didn't rename it because you have Halloween in the timeline, then you have Halloween Mm -hmm. in the timeline, then you have Halloween Kills. Whatever. We're not going to go into that until later. So, the town of Haddonfield unites to confront Michael, who, in the previous movie, they set the entire house on fire and then the police or the, the fire department shows up and they release him. And then he just kills him. And he escapes. And it's just so stupid. And I just like, whatever, I get why it would happen. They'd be like, oh, who's this guy stuck in the basement at this flaming house? Mm -hmm. Lori should have called ahead and been like, hey, don't fucking save my house. Yes. The fire department shows up. They save Michael. And then he just kills them all. 
The film highlights lots of characters from the previous original movies, all Tommy Doyle, who like rallies the town, just like in, I believe, Halloween 4, when uh, they chase down Michael Myers. Yes. And shoot the fuck out of him. That was Halloween 4. As the night escalates, the film examines the theme of community fear and the consequences of collective trauma ultimately leading to the whole town experiencing revelations about the legacy of Michael Myers. What are they, what are they chanting? Evil lives no more. Yeah, yeah. They're like, this, this one I liked more than the one before it. Erroneous. But... I like it, it was a little ridiculous. I think the reason why I liked it is because we have all of these characters coming back in and I'm just like maybe a sucker for like a tie-in or a cameo or a nostalgia or whatever. Fucking Tommy Doyle getting in there and fucking rallying the whole crowd got me super fucking pumped. So I was excited about that. Not surprising, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about like it was kind of like an open mic night. Yeah. Where they're just like telling the stories of them surviving well because it's halloween night and it's what 40 years yeah. later and it's all the people that like were survivors from that original murder yeah and so they all fucking like or i guess yeah it is the original murder mm-hmm. are you sure because me i think it might be including the second one because there's like the nurse right no so it's the girl the girl was babysat yeah yeah by Lori but Shrazer. isn't there an older nurse? No, there's the two nurses. There's the But they're not new. They're not part of the original story. No, they're just complaining about yeah. them being too loud. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it is just the first movie. Pretty sure. Okay. I thought that I didn't love this movie. So No, you just said that. Yeah. Not I'm not soaked about that answer. I didn't love this movie. I thought it was better than the one before it. I do not. I think the one before this one was was, was better. I thought this one was just kind of like, mm. yeah. I mean, there were lots of flashbacks. Oh, I don't think it's going to continue. I think you don't think they're going to do more Halloween movies? I do think they will, but I think it's going to have to be a reboot. Yeah. Okay. Jamie Lee Curtis is like fucking seventy. It's fair. Yeah. Yeah. You got questions? Halloween ends. What else we got? Yeah, nothing. Nothing? Halloween Kills, other than I thought Halloween was better than Halloween Kills. Okay. And I'm like, not a whole lot different, because I didn't love either of them, but I like the second one more. I think mostly for the nostalgic aspect of it, they're like, you get to see these characters come back, mm-hmm. which like, for some reason, I didn't like that in Halloween 6, because it was like, shitty Paul Rudd, with his like, awful acting in that movie. It's not um, terrible to say. Don't say. I'm just saying it's not his fault that the writing was so bad and that everyone was so awkward just and it. nothing made any fucking sense in that movie. Act. It's not his fault. Yep. I'm just saying. You just said shitty Paul Rudd. You, you blamed him. Go to hell. All right. Halloween ends. It's all you, bud. Take it away. What do you think? T- explain it. Do you have the plot twist or anything, or the plot about it, or do you want me to explain? All right, so this one is set four years after the events of Halloween Kills. The film explores a, like, not desolate, but like a quiet Haddonfield that's grappling with the aftermath of the Michael Myers terror. Lori is now a grandmother. She's trying to move on with her life, but as this new unknown killer emerges so the she, narrative delves into the impact of violence and fear on a community so she was a grandmother for all three of the movies that her oh, yeah, her sure. granddaughter was in all three of those movies yeah so this movie starts with there's like a random couple and there's a new babysitter and it's a guy babysitter and he like watches a scary movie with this kid mm mm-hmm. And then this kid tricks him and locks him into a closet. This babysitter freaks out, kicks the door open. And when he kicks the door open, it knocks the kid with the door off of, I'd say, 10, no, I'd probably say four flights of stairs that this giant mansion had. And the the parents walked in at the same time as their kids slam fell to their death. This whole movie kind of follows this kid 
becoming troubled and helping Michael Myers in the middle, like murder people and try to like take over Michael Myers' legacy. He also starts to date Laurie Stroud's granddaughter. Granddaughter. And Laurie Stroud's. And this is the same kid from the previous two movies. No, he's a new kid. Okay. Yes. Not in the previous movies. See, I, like, I have something, like, there's something weird. I don't know. I, it I was feel like weird. Like, this kid, the, Lori's granddaughter, what's her name in the movies? I can't remember. But the dude that she's dating in Halloween and Halloween Kills, right? No, it's not the same kid. He's he, No, but he has something. I, I don't know what I've seen him in, but he's a fucking, he's a killer in something, and I right. can't remember what no, it is. No, this is, they both have curly hair. This is a different dude. Anyways, this kid. Keep going helps Michael Myers, like, assist him in killing for the first part of the movie, and then gets upset, goes and... Like with uh, the doctor? What? No. In the original... Not in the original Halloween, but in 2018 Halloween. Yeah. Where, like, the doctor is, like, almost, like... Helping him. Emphasize. Like, he's not necessarily helping him kill. He wants to... He wants to see him yeah. say something, pretty much. No, he, like, literally hold... Like, he brings this girl's like ex-boyfriend into the sewers where, where Michael Myers is living and holds this dude so Michael Myers can kill him. Oh, uh, okay. And then after that, he steals Michael Myers' mask and goes and kills for himself. Like, kills other characters. Yeah. And then Michael Myers comes and kills him. Takes the- He's like, hey, fucking quit it, dude. It's my shit. Yeah, I thought it was a, a terrible plot line. Okay, so I remember where this kid came from. Okay. You. Is that the same the main character? And it's the boyfriend from 2018 and Halloween Kills. Okay. He's he's in the, the show You, and he's like the shitty little boyfriend that... I've never seen You. I haven't? Yeah. Man. Sorry. It's crazy. It's a crazy show. Anything else you got for Halloween Ends? So you don't have much on Halloween Ends. I don't have anything. Because you didn't watch it. I didn't watch it. No, it costs it cost money, and I also ran out of time because we watched what is this? 13. I watched twelve. You watched thirteen yeah. movies in the last two weeks. Not to mention the actual other movies that we watched. Uh, I'm a busy guy. You're a busy guy. I appreciate the fact you were able to do it all. Yeah, I can't do it all. Way Sorry, really Superman. Fucking... Sorry, Superman. I can't handle it. Way to ruin the ending of this podcast, dude. By not like just like there's not a just like letting it fade. What? By, no, we're not even close. By dude. not finishing the movie. That's okay. Hey, that's all good. Either way, it was. I thought it was a terrible ending of a trilogy. Really? To be honest with you, yeah. Oh, I don't love that. Yeah, I, I I thought the first two were significantly better than this one. Okay, and then not a good closer. No. Okay. Literally, Michael kills this guy. Lori Stroud watches this guy get killed, and then Michael comes in. Snaps this dude's neck, and then she kills Michael Myers for good. How? On a table. He, How? She stabs him. He, she slits his throat. She literally has shot him through his eyeballs in his brain. Yes. So after she slits his throat. In the, in the well, fucking Rob Zombie one. I remember. I remember. She shoots him in the fucking head, obviously, like through his fucking brains. So she slits his throat. And they go, that's not going to work this time. And then they tie him to the top of a cop car. And a bunch of police are like, this is not how I do things here. And, then, <laughs> and they all lose their fucking mind. The, the, and then the sheriff with the cowboy hat mm-hmm. is like, it is tonight. And so he they drives it into the river. whole town follows as they drive by the cars onto the top of the car. And then they throw him in a fucking car compactor. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like a cool wood chip or something. No. So they survive a car compactor. No, for sure. they watch, you watch his fucking limbs just like completely just go everywhere. And that's how it ends? Mm-hmm. Damn. And then she that like, was right. Laurie Stroud's like writing a story about okay. her whole. Wow. Okay. Nope. Interesting. I think from there, is, do you have anything else you have to add for Halloween Ends? No. Anything on the trilogy? No. All right. I'm going to go straight into just a couple more questions. All right. Why do we love 
the Halloween series, the franchise as a whole. Murder. What is it? Murder. There's lots of murder and lots of franchises. This is slasher. Like, yes, it's the birth of the slasher genre. Maybe there's like, I'm not going to call Psycho birth of flat, slasher. Mm-mm. I'm going to call Texas Chainsaw maybe like just before this. Mm-hmm. It was the year before. Definitely fucking gave a lot of emphasis into the genre. But why is it that this movie has the staying power that it does? Because he could be human the whole time. He could be. Are there? And I think that we can kind of agree that the ones that he is more human in are the better ones. Right? Except for the first one. Because I think that the first movie is phenomenal, but we see just Michael Myers, without explanation, is just a killing machine that just kills for the for killing's sake. Yes. But from that, we get, like, definition of, like, suspense. And what makes horror good is a suspenseful horror. If we want to see something that's maybe... I mean, I, I don't want to say, like, there's plenty of suspense in, like, movies like Saw and stuff like that. You know, when, when things happen quicker than we're expecting them to... We lose, we don't have the fear of what is going to happen next kind of thing. Um, and I think that that's what the Halloween genre for them, or like the Halloween franchise for the most part has been so good at. Like, what else makes this a special franchise? Redeveloping char- or re- characters that we like have known to grow and love yeah. coming back and back. I think that not in lots of slashers do we see, you know, we have. I mean, like, much later, Sidney Prescott and Scream. You know, in Nightmare, do we have characters that are continuously evolving through this? Not that I can think Through the movies? I don't remember either. If I'm wrong, please let us know. Yeah. Same with Friday. Like, we have Tommy Jarvis, some characters that show up recurringly, but they're not the focus over and over and over again. Whereas with Halloween, we get to see characters develop and i think that we also in the slasher genre lose a little bit when the characters are let's call it metaphysical where they don't get affected i think it's what loses you a little bit in the thorn series is that like they're not human so like why do we really care about these characters whereas i think that like you know halloween 2 rob zombies halloweens even these end ones and like not so much in the the 2000s resurrection in H2O. We get to care or like understand who Michael's character is. And I think that that's important to understanding the movie itself. Because if it's just mindless and it's just meaningless, somehow it's scarier but not as scary at the same time. When there's a reason for something, whether it's completely blind rage like in the Rob Zombie movies, or some kind of untold mission, like in the first Halloween and second Halloween, I think we it's, it's a scary thing that we have to contemplate. And when there's a monster that doesn't really have any discretion and just kills meaninglessly, it's scary for sure to know that there's no reason, but at the same time, like it loses a lot of meaning. You ready to go into rankings? Yes, I am. Sorry, I lost my voice. You're good, dude. All right. Yeah, let's go to number 13. Okay. Jamie, who's in your last spot? My last spot is Resurrection. You have Halloween Resurrection, Resurrection in your th- number 13 spot. Yes. I have Halloween 6 in my number 13 spot. Perfect. In my number 12 spot, I have Halloween Resurrection, though. I think we're pretty close on this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to call that even. In my 12th spot, I have 3. Halloween 3? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. What's your 11 spot? My 11 spot is going to be 5. Okay. Halloween 5 is also my 11 spot. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, my 10 spot is going to be Halloween Ends. My 10 spot is going to be Halloween 2 Rob Zombie Edition. Really? Yeah. Okay. So that's quite a bit lower than mine. Mm-hmm. In my 9 spot, I have. Right? We're up to nine now? Mm Mm-hmm. Halloween three. I have Halloween ends. Okay. So we're pretty close on Halloween ends there. The next spot will be the eight, and I have Halloween 2018. 
I have Halloween 6. Oh, see, I had that in my last spot, so that's interesting. I, I totally see, I fucking liked, hated that movie. I liked the... You like Paul Rudd. You got a crush on Paul Rudd. I also liked the metal, 90s metal thing. And I hated the 90s metal. The noodle, dude. It was awful. All right. Um, We go to the 7 spot now. I have Halloween Kills. I have... I would do the Halloween Kills, too. That makes sense to me. Okay. So now we go to the six, and I have Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 at the sixth spot. Wow. Yep. I probably have Halloween 4. Okay. I can see that totally, though. What do you have in front of Halloween 4? At number five? At the five spot. Rob Zombie's Halloween 1. Really? Yes. So we are now hitting the four spot. Wait, no. I actually didn't hit my five spot. My five will be Halloween 7, which is Halloween H2O. Ooh, that's what I was missing. Is fucking yep. really good. It's a... If you were going to... If this was basketball or hockey, where we have a five lineup, mm-hmm. that five is a good fucking five. Mm-hmm. Our top five here looks really fucking good. Jamie, what's your number four? My four is going to be Halloween 2018. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so much higher than mine. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Okay. My four is Halloween 4. Mm-hmm. It's the easily the best of the Thorn series. Yeah. And the fact that she kills her... You know, her, we don't have to explain it. We can okay. go right into it. All right, we're rolling to the three. What do you have in the three spot? H2O. H2O is in the three? I have Halloween 1978 in the three spot. Okay. Okay. Which means I have Halloween 2 in the two spot. Mm Mm-hmm. What is your two? Halloween 2. And I have Rob Zombie's Halloween in the one spot, taking it home. You know what I have. I have Halloween 1. Yep. You got the OG in there. Of course. I have to. Those are the two best, too. Yep. I don't think we were too far off. No. Nope. Um, there were some that were very different. Um, you specifically liked six more than I did. Mm-hmm. And I think I liked Rob Zombie much more than you did. But other than that, I think we we're pretty within two places along the rest of the way. So I think I think we're good, dude. I think we did a pretty kick ass coverage. There's a lot, man. All of these fucking movies. What are we at? Fucking three hours now? We are. I'm like my brain is toast. Yep. I'm toast. Yeah. All right. With that said, with that with that said, ado, with that is said, ado, please like and subscribe. Listen Guys, let us again. know what your favorite Halloweens are. And that too. Give us your top thirteen. Write it somewhere, unless you've never watched them, like Peter Adam. I've seen two of them out of the thirteen. Yeah. I thought it was cool to go back through them, man. It was really cool. Too. I loved it. All right, with that being said, I have one of these. Make sure to drink down your demons. 